Thanks for tuning in and for Thanks for tuning in and for Thanks for tuning in and for Thanks for tuning in
All right. I guess that's that's it. I need to. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so this is my first time ever streaming to um, a different Twitch channel. I don't know how this is all gonna pan out, but uh, it's, it's go time. I'm here. Hope everyone's having a great night, morning, whatever time it is for you. But um, yeah, I guess we'll sort of hop right into some things. Hello, Fublas. How long is the stream? Uh, somewhere probably in the three to five hour range. We'll be messing around. I usually try to get up to a, a good wrapping up point, and when it comes to things like physics, who knows when that's going to be. So, um, I guess a little bit about myself. I am, I go by Jitspo online, but my real name is Nathan Wolf, and I created a indie studio called Lone Wolf Studio. It's spelled W-U-L-F, because that's my last name. I thought, <laughs> I figured that would be appropriate. Mr. Elliptic, hello, hello, hello. Um, and yeah, so I worked in the AAA industry for mm, about 10 years or so. Worked at Red Storm on things like uh, some of the Ghost Recon games. Worked on Ghost Recon Future Soldier. Worked on... Uh, oops, I thought I'd turn those notifications off. Sorry, wait. Those are notified. Uh, okay. <laughs> Those those are notifications from my old stream. I'm I'm still got I'm I'm not like I said. This is my first time streaming to a different channel, um, so I turn those off. Wait, sound alerts are on. All right, I'll delete that one. And delete. Maybe it still plays the sounds if people follow. All right. I guess we'll just delete it. I created a new. Um, a new profile for this, so hopefully I'm not deleting anything off of my my main OBS stuff. Yeah. So anyway, I um, yeah worked at Red Storm for uh, about seven years, and then worked over at a studio that Cliff Plazinski started up called Boss Key Productions, and then I went to. Um, yeah, I may just hide the stream avatars. I wasn't sure if I, <laughs> if I should have those going. I guess I could keep uh, keep myself and Wolfman bot out there. I could not find a way to get the stream avatars to use a different Twitch thing without having all the OAuth stuff. So I usually just have that there covering up my taskbar because you guys don't want to. <laughs> it's just completely jam packed with everything. As an indie dev, there's so much stuff on my taskbar. It's it's kind of unsightly. Uh, so we just, we just cover that up with some nice grass from the stream avatars. But yeah, anyway, uh, Bosky Productions, we worked on um, Radical Heights and Lawbreakers. Well, Lawbreakers first, and that didn't do too well. We tried to do kind of uh, Last Hail Mary with Radical Heights, but it was a little too low, too late, and the studio ended up shutting down. So I decided to go do my own thing. And as I was looking for different engines to use, I wanted something that was like an open source engine that I could kind of go in and develop all the stuff that I wanted to from scratch. And a couple people had mentioned Godot and I fired it up, messed around with it for a couple hours and I was making some stuff and I was like, oh, this is pretty sweet. And so I've just been using it ever since. It's, I've been using it since Godot 3.0, I believe. So yeah, 3.1 was a big update for me. And I started working on a project called Fist of the Forgotten, which um, started in Godot 3.0, which is a, it was supposed to be my like first solo project. So I was kind of keeping it small in scope and um, you know, how game dev projects go. The, you know, the amount of detail and polish and stuff you want to put in there and it start it like okay so it's like i'm gonna make a little platformer and it's gonna have a giant mechanical fist you jump and punch and you know that's that's kind of it but then as i realized as i was developing that like there's so many platformers out there because so many people use platformers as kind of their you know first project that you have to really stand out as a platformer so i went 
you know, further and further into trying to make this like a much uh, something that stands out a lot more. And I, um, I don't know. I started getting really attached to the characters and stuff, and then it's it's been an ongoing thing. Yeah, I'll stress some fists that I've forgotten. Uh, I don't think I have the project open, but I can just run it. Well, actually. Yeah, this is not going to be the, the main focus of tonight, but I'll show off. We'll fire up uh, Godot. I, st I haven't moved from Godot 3 yet. I'm still using Godot 3 for Fist of the Forgotten. But Kook, which is the main project today, is... Uh, I started that in Godot Engine 4 back when it was in... I don't even know if it was quite in beta yet. It was sort of a little side project. Well, not a little side project, but a side project. It's something that I'd always wanted to do, kind of make a Quake-like retro FPS, but then add some modern lighting and such to it and do all this like per texel self-shadowing. And I'll show you that in a little bit, but uh, we'll fire up Fist of the Forgotten real quick. And uh, Quiet Sonia, yes, this is a commercial project. Both of these are commercial projects. I've actually got three commercial projects that I've been working on in Ghetto. One of them is um, actually done. That was originally a Loot and Array Game Jam game called Goop Loop. And yeah, I guess that uh, that command doesn't work here. <laughs> I think it. Oh wait, no, that was never even brought over to the new bot. But uh, I'm so used to my bot commands on. <laughs> On my channel, here, let me, I'll just paste a link in here. There's... There's the link to the, uh, the one project that I've actually completed in Ghetto, which was originally a game jam game for Luna Ray, like I said. The theme was stuck in a loop and I decided to take that literally and have a uh, little goop that sticks in the loop. Ah, thanks. But yeah, I'll show a little bit of Fist of the Forgotten here. I guess I can show a little goop loop, and then we'll do some kook stuff. So you can see a few different um, different things. This is actually a work in progress level. Uh, you're supposed to start in the train and then get out, but as I've been testing some stuff, and working on some different things. I uh, <laughs> I have it spawning outside of the train so that I don't have to deal with that like opening every time. So there's huge focus on momentum in this game. So you can slide down hills and then gain speed and if you're moving up a hill when you jump you get a little extra height. So you can see if I jump normally you know I don't jump nearly that high but I can build up a bunch of momentum, go fly in there, pick up some secrets And then I can go over here, flip the switch, and that clears the block. This is one of the very first levels that just kind of gets you, gets players familiar with the uh, the concept of the game. And then this is a, I'll give you guys a, a peek at a cutscene sequence that I've been working on. So I actually cut out into first person for the cutscenes and have some uh, full color stuff so you can actually see a little bit of the lore and whatnot. Argus, hello. And then later on, you get this big fist that you can use and punch in multiple directions and all that kind of stuff. But this is not really about Fist of the Forgotten. This is just another project that I'm working on. Don't let it go. I am working on it. Like, I do Fist of the Forgotten Friday, so I'm working on it like one day a week. But the challenging thing with game dev is not just building the game but finding the appropriate market and target audience and all that kind of stuff so I've been struggling to find the audience for this one if I'm being completely honest so I don't want to abandon it but I feel like retro FPS games have been doing pretty well so that's why I've switched my primary focus over to Kook which is a, um, 
a retro FPS, quick like retro FPS. I, you know, it's, I wish that were true, Mux. You're making movement FPS? Nice. Small little 2D platform. It started out that way. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, I'll just load up the start level. Then we can... I can go around to talk about some of the, uh, some of the graphics and stuff without any enemies harassing us. It'd be cool if it had books. <laughs> so yeah, this is Kook here. Um, I guess we can turn... Oh, actually, this doesn't have a soundtrack on it yet, this level. So, you know, I'm, I'm paying homage to Quake. I don't know if you guys have ever played Quake, but there's a start level, and there's three different hallways you can walk down to select the difficulty. So I'm paying homage to that, except they're street-themed. So I've got sort of a Victorian-era London area. So we got easy street, select easy difficulty, and then you can kind of go down to middle road if you want sort of the medium difficulty. And then we've got hard way over here if you want the hard difficulty. And like Quake, you have to do a little puzzle platforming to, well not puzzle platforming, just, I guess just platforming to get to the nightmare skill. So. If you go wander down here, you'll notice we get some uh, crazy gravity distortion stuff. Hey, you know this game, huh? <laughs> and this selects the nightmare difficulty. And it is, of course, on Elm Street. Oops. Okay, I've got a little <laughs> a little oddity going on with the, uh, the difficulty selection there. I think the inherited momentum from the um, the teleporters <laughs> carried me back into the the selection area okay there we go high road and a low road <laughs> hey what's up Lagiri <laughs> Um, but yeah, one of the things that I really wanted to do that, uh, sort of inspired me to make this is have per texel shadows and, um, uh, trying to find a good example. So, okay, here we go. These bricks, they're mostly flat in color, but we've got this light source over here that's casting light. You can see if the light is cast flat on the bricks. You know, they're sort of flat. But if it's cast down at an angle, you know, they're they're pretty much flat here. But over here, I've got some self-shadowing going on where you can see the bricks are actually casting shadows per texel. There is normal maps, but there's there's um, some self-shadowing going on beyond that. So we've got these... Um, I basically step through the texels or the pixels on the texture and see if there if there's a height map on here. So I've got that bricks at sort of varying heights. So we step along all these texels and then if we hit something that's higher based on the angle toward the light, then it'll actually cast a shadow. So you can kind of see some of the shadows cast at different angles here to kind of make it look like the textures were authored uh, here. This is actually a little bit better. So we've got uh, some of these bricks that kind of looks like they're sticking out because you can see they're sort of casting shadows out here. So that's one thing that kind of inspired me to make the game. Uh, just wanting to do that and then basically kind of building a whole game around that aesthetic. And I've also done some... Um, some stuff. I did have some engine modifications, but I think it's possible to do without modifications now, because they've added something for... Uh, I don't know what it is. I've got some weird bug where after I go through a teleporter, I, I keep drifting. Um, but anyway, I've, I've made all of the shadows per, te per texel. So a texel, for those who don't know, is basically a 3D pixel. So it's like the pixel of this texture here. But you notice the shadow cast from this wall is all 
casting perfectly on each texel on the ground there. So it really gives it that retro vibe, but we also have some more modern stuff with real-time lighting and such. Abnormal maps too. <laughs> so, and the other thing that's fun that you can't really do with Quake without doing a lot of weird uh, teleporters and such is that I can actually alter the angle. So now we were walking on this as the ground, but now we're on a different axis. So I've got a lot of nice mind-bending stuff going on here. So those of you familiar with MC Escher might uh, might recognize this area. So if I go through a portal here, now I'm on the same axis as this dude. If I walk over here, that's the portal that I went through. I went up those stairs. <laughs> kick is very cool. Yeah, we've got a got a kick in here. It sort of upsets the enemies when you do that then. <laughs> But uh, they're set to be somewhat peaceful on this level, so you can just wander around and explore things. How is the world, or how's the work with 3D? You know? um, I have not had a lot of people have said that it's you know it's like a more of a 2D engine, but I started out working in 3D and was pretty happy with it. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the engine if you want to do like super high fidelity stuff. Although I've had, there are some games that are doing some pretty impressive stuff visually, uh, but so I, it's it's definitely moving up in that regard. But back at in 3.0 when I started, um, the it was a little more limited in that regard. Yeah, we got the Godot plushie here. Uh, but it's perfect for doing the, the kind of aesthetic that I'm doing here with like Fist of the Forgotten, the silhouette style and um, you know retro stuff and being able to just program and customize the engine exactly how I want it to. Do I adjust the shadow in post? No, I um, I modify the vertex position so that the it's rounded to the nearest texel. Yes, I did build the maps via transfer room. Yeah, yeah, I made the uh, the Godot plushie. I put some uh, Kook goggles on there. If you've seen the logo for Kook, you might recognize that. And also gave him some squeaky sounds. <laughs> and if you're really mean, you can drop kick him. Yeah, we've got all kinds of physics stuff in here, so you can throw books around, kick books around, shoot them around, and other objects. We can even take the ghetto plushie and turn him into a weapon. Oh, I messed up. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what a way to take out cultists, right? Yeah, I'm using Jolt for the physics. And you're welcome, Creation Kit. Yeah, I've got a uh, BSP add-on for those who want to use Trench Broom to make levels. Or I guess you can use any Quake level editor. But if you go over here and you search on the asset library for uh, BSP, that Quake BSP importer, is something that I added. Another useful add-on is the developer console. 
search for that. It's really easy to drop in your project. And then this thing that you see right here allows you to you know type different commands, like I can type God and enable God mode. And then all that is on the code side, if I search for that, is you just go in to, I don't know, your ready function or wherever you want to put it, and then do console.add command and then point it to the point it to the function and then you can specify the number of parameters as well. So uh, God just checks if the player has invulnerability and toggles it and turns God mode on and off. And then um, if you want to have a parameter, that's pretty easy to do. So it just takes a string for the parameter and then you can go in and just convert that to float or whatever you want. Yeah, Road to Vostik is really impressive what they're doing with Godot. But a lot of that just goes to show it's a lot more about the art direction and the artists than it is the engine itself. Like, you can make really good looking games in just about any engine these days. Did I get the arms behaving? Um, it, there's still a little weirdness where, because of the, I've got the... Um, character attached or the uh the little godot plushie attached to the character um whenever that updates it stops the physics updating so it only updates the arms and legs when it ticks more physics updates than there are uh rendered updates so still gotta figure that out Is there a trash can or bucket-like item to make shots into? Um, there is a trash can, but I haven't made it so you can throw things into it. <laughs> it's just like a physics object. Do I have dog mode as well? Not yet. Exactly, Valentines, yeah. Like, there's different tools that work better for different things. But some people have taken things that maybe aren't really great at that tool, for that tool, and have made it work, you know? I've seen people use Unreal Engine to make like a 2D pixel art platformer, and it's like, okay, well, I mean, you made it work. It seems like a bit overkill for something like that, but sure. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm trying to make a living off of this. I've not uh, not gotten to the point yet where I am self-sustained. Uh, I'm living off of savings at the moment, so I've still got a bit of runway. Hopefully, I can get a large project out there and actually make some money or make enough money. I mean, I'm making some money off of like Goop Loop and and twitch and stuff, but it's not a lot. It's a long, bumpy road, yeah. Yeah, so I, I made Goop Loop just to kind of go through the process of releasing a game. So... That was originally a Ludum Duray game jam. I'll show that off really quickly. <laughs> so this is a completely physics-based game, and you can use. Nice. You you don't have direct control over the loop. All you have control over is the goop, and as soon as it sticks to the loop, it's stuck there. So you gotta like manipulate the goop, jump around, build up momentum, and. Uh, Try to traverse the level. Look, Ma, I'm on a video title. Oh, wait, you're not my mom. Yeah. Yeah, I've got narration as well. So, you know, if you just, I don't know, want to hear some of my terrible puns, you can play Goop Loop. And then I've got all kinds of little triggers and stuff where it's like... <laughs> it's kind of like someone's with you, like, commenting and such. A plus terrible puns. So you got to, like... Get up momentum. 
sweet! And then the goop gets all happy if you make it past things. Oh. I don't know if I like that color. Then you can pick up these little buckets and give yourself different colors. Customizations. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's goop loop. My ho, 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 ho. Now you're cooking. Small projects. Can you make it up this time? Whoa, got some nice air on that one. Well, if you made it past this, you can get past anything. As long as it's not more difficult than this. And this wasn't just a fluke. That was that was the yes you can, by the way. It didn't do the voice line because it got interrupted by something else. Oh, there we go. All right, I'll just show one little thing here. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Well, you're getting pretty good at going fast the wrong direction. Why don't you try doing that <laughs> the other way? So there's all kinds of little traps and stuff that make you lose progress. Oh, yeah, there's a gap there. I really should have put some kind of warning or something. Goop loop and coop ain't no floop. <laughs> so you're... <laughs> You hear some sounds over there. And then... Oh. Just in time. Yeah, look, there's there's a sign. Why didn't you... Why, why didn't you notice the sign that, that was there? <laughs> wow, even with a the sign there, you still managed to fall down? Alright, so... That's Goob Loop. It's like... I don't know, four bucks on Steam, I think. It's a little... Little thing, but one thing I've discovered um, when you make a small game, it's actually really difficult. It's difficult to be profitable because the amount of time and effort that it takes to like promote the game actually sometimes ends up costing more than the sales you get, even if you completely disregard the amount of time it takes to develop the game. So it's like if I'm spending $10 on marketing to get $5 in sales, then it's sort of not profitable. <laughs> so that's why I have not been focusing so much on trying to promote Goop Loop and just hoping that uh, when I finish one of my larger projects that I want to sell for around like the $20 mark, that it'll be a lot more profitable. But anyway, um, the thing that I thought would be cool to work on for today's stream is the Steam Cycle or steam-powered motorcycle. So, Kook is very, um, very steampunk-themed. And so Grey Artificer really wanted a steam motorcycle. So I've been working on one. Uh, this is the model I've been working on in Blender. Maybe a little bit high detail for the retro look, but I wanted it to look cool and get all the, the moving parts and such in there. So, you know, we got the boiler and the um, little steam engines that rotate the wheel around. I got a little, little steam whistle, headlamp, all that kind of stuff. And so, as an experiment, I tried making this um, entirely with physics, like rigid body physics, just to see what would happen. And... It's interesting, but it hasn't quite, it's not really that controllable. It does some crazy stuff. So basically what I did is I set it up. I've got a rigid body for the steam cycle. There's just a little box here. And then I put a hinge joint on the back wheel there. And then that's got a, you can enable uh, motors on the hinge joints. So basically we have a motor that just makes the wheel spin. And then we've got another hinge joint that is for the handlebars here. So that's at an angle there. Kind of like a real motorbike is set up. And there's a reason for that because it actually ends up making it somewhat self-stabilizing. Self and uh, then we got another joint for the front wheel that is attached to that. So basically have all these parts moving together and let's see. I'm going to quit out of that. So we don't have so much stuff open. And the end result is that we got 
this. So we can move, we can kind of steer with it, but it's, it's kind of surprising that it works at all, considering it's like purely physics driven. We're not, you know, I'm not moving the thing forward. I'm just spinning the wheel and then the traction from the wheel is pushing the wheel forward and that's pushing the rest of the, the body forward and it sort of works, but it's really difficult to steer. So <laughs> making these really wide turns here because if I try to steer too fast, then it, the front wheel just kind of freaks out. And then sometimes when I bump into things, I just go flying or yeah, like that. So <laughs> it kind of, kind of freaks out. So what I'm gonna do or attempt to do tonight is build um, something where I just do some shape casts and then have a lot more control over the actual physics rather than trying to make it all purely based off of rigid bodies and hoping for the best. Death wobbles at high speed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely has some some elements of realism in there. And it's, it's kind of fun that, you know, I've got... Uh, all the interactions that I've got from like kicking rigid bodies and stuff so it definitely has the back wheel spinning that's why it's kind of doing some crazy stuff there um, I can actually jump off of it while it's running and sometimes it'll self-stabilize and just kind of keep going <laughs> I do have some money hopping in the game so I'm trying to catch up with it here oh, look at it go and it's down. Well, now it's going up. It's going backward, upside down. Nope, oh, it righted itself. Look at that! Wow. <laughs> so it's pretty fun, but um, also very frustrating to actually use in an actual like game environment where things are shooting at you and such. It's a cunning ploy to get past me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, rigid bodies are definitely weird. Yeah, so I plan to use a character body. Actually, what I'm thinking of doing is what I did on Radical Heights. Unfortunately, I don't have the source code for that, but um, effectively what I did for Radical Heights is I had two, basically two spheres, one for each wheel. And so when the uh, when the vehicle would move, we've got a velocity, you know, as you as you press forward, it accelerates these spheres. And then, you know, one sphere would move forward, and then the other sphere would move forward, and then it would try to maintain um, a set distance between the two. So it's like this is this is how far apart the wheels are supposed to be. So then if one wheel happens to, say, bump into a wall or something, so say there's a wall there, and then this wheel is like trying to go forward, but then it hits the wall and it stops. And then this other wheel doesn't hit the wall, so it goes forward. Now you just have to have, kind of resolve that difference and then push the back wheel back and uh, And it sort of, it sort of works kind of like a, I guess almost like a particle system, where you've got if you're trying to do like a particle system style simulation of physics. <laughs> Actual madness. When I get on, do I use the kick action to get it started? That would be kind of funny, actually. I didn't even think about that. New game, catch the motorcycle. So, yeah, um, I don't know, this, this could be one of those things where, like, things work out and I make some progress, or I could just be scratching my head for the next four hours. Not sure how that's going to go. Uh, but I can show you how I've got things set up on this one. So, actually, one of the things that I'm trying to do with this project is sort of an experiment. When I went to GDC some years back and talk to the developers of Overwatch. This is back when Overwatch first came out, it was a while back. Um, 
they were talking about this was like uh, when ECS or the entity component system started becoming the rage and they use the entity component system for Overwatch and the way that's set up if people are not familiar with entity component system is that instead of having your typical class where everything's sort of self-contained on that class you know you've got like a player and then the player handles its own movement and its own shooting or whatever um, you have entities which are basically just an index like there's nothing really on them and then you have components which sort of reference the entity so the entity basically has like a list of components and then you have systems that operate on the components or groups of components so you know you might have a movement component that handles um, the player movement data on the players and uh, so I actually am trying, even though Godot is set up in a much more object-oriented style system for this project, I've got a massive number of um, systems set up here. So if you look at my auto load list, it's like we got the trigger system and the camera system, and the waypoint system and the player system. And so the actual entities themselves or nodes or whatever you want to call them basically just store the data and then all of the logic is on the systems because people were saying that um, you know a lot of the programmers that I talked to were saying they really liked the ECS from a structural standpoint because everything like all of the logic you didn't have to go searching for you know well if the player interacts with something is the interaction logic on the uh, thing that they're interacting with is it on the player you know is it in one of these other locations it's like okay no that's all the interactions in the interaction system and that just takes a player and the thing they're interacting with or whatever um so i've been trying to use that approach for this project just to kind of see if i like it or not you know it definitely has its pros and cons so for this i've actually got a vehicle system and the vehicle system is where we're doing uh, the processing. You know, we're checking if it breaks, then we set the flags to enable the motor on or off or whatever. Um, and then the vehicle itself, well, that's the base class of the vehicle, but the only thing we do, oh, I do have something in here. That's just for the visuals though. Uh, but. Basically, I'm doing all the processing on there. This one little thing that's a little bit weird with this is that I have tried to do all, like have an array of things and then update them in the systems. But due to the order of things, sometimes if you like delete something or, um, you know, when things get added and removed from the trees, like that stuff's all automatically handled in the process and physics process functions. So <laughs> I opted to just have this simple thing where I have like a couple lines of code in there and it just calls into the system to update it so that uh, I can do all the processing in the system but I don't have to worry about things getting deleted out from under me and Thetra thank you <laughs> yeah it's a lot of auto loads but you know each thing has its thing that it does so if you try to dump too much stuff on one thing, then it starts getting confusing. Like I could put the vehicle movement in the movement system, maybe, but it seems to make more sense to have something dedicated to vehicles. Because they're not gonna move the way a player moves. But the players and enemies move the same way, so they both you they both share the movement system, which is another nice thing about that. If you have um, two kind of very different entities, it's a lot easier to share code when it's in the systems. But you know, it's just kind of a different approach. So um, I think what we're gonna do, I'm gonna leave the old Steam cycle. I actually renamed it before the stream so that we've got. Uh, the steam cycle physics based and then we'll have a regular steam cycle that is going to um, 
hopefully behave a little more sanely. All right, Valiant. Mm, excuse me, Valiant Cheese. Thanks for swinging by. So, let's see. I um, guess first thing to do. I'm actually going to rename this one. And then we'll make a new one. Ooh. Oh. Oh. No. That was weird. I'm not sure what that error is about. Looks like it's still renamed it though. Okay. Let me double check and make sure it still works. Hey, Sarah. Grumble Pugs. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for the raid. Uh, <laughs> I'm so used to my notifications, I didn't even notice the, the raid happened. Okay, so looks like it's still working. So yeah, I wanted to keep the old one just so we have that for reference. Maybe there might be an Easter egg or something in the game where people can find the old physics-based one and <laughs> just play around with it or I don't know. Maybe we'll have a little test level, experimental level or something like that. Alright, have a good rest, Grumble. This game looks kooky. It is kooky for sure. The Godot coding engine is much easier. Um, I feel like it's pretty beginner friendly. I mean, a lot of it is kind of subjective and it's what you're used to and what you've programmed with in the past. But I definitely feel like Godot is really easy to jump into and start making things happen. How did the name Kook come about? Well, the original name was um, Tremble because I was making a Quake-like, so I thought it'd be funny to call it Trimble because it's like a synonym for Quake. But there was another game called Trimble, and I couldn't get... It looked like it kind of got abandoned, and I couldn't get in touch with any of the developers, so I didn't want to, like, stomp on their feet or anything like that. So I kind of poked around for nice short words that I could potentially use that weren't used for other video games. I don't remember exactly how I came about Kook, but I think I just went through like all the four letter words. I was looking for, you know, like doom and stuff. And um, I was like, oh, that's that's fitting. You know, it's got kind of the, the retro doom or blood vibes. Um, but then it's, a, it's kind of an archaic word, which kind of makes sense because the setting is back in Victorian era London. So, having kind of an archaic word fits. The only downside is there's a lot of people that aren't familiar with that word. <laughs> so, um, they don't know, you know, that it means crazy. But, it's fine. The, the downside is people don't necessarily know how to spell it. Like, they think it's like cook or something you know when they're pronouncing it and uh and if i say it out loud they don't necessarily know how it's spelled but it's nice and simple once you once you see it hopefully people will remember it you're not surprised but very surprised at the same time you thought i meant to cook Yeah, you can put semicolons at the end of lines if you want to. Yeah, indentation-based programming or languages is some like bit of a hotly debated thing. I'm pretty neutral on it. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's convenient to be able to just put some curly braces around things and have them 
and have it just work without having to indent a bunch of stuff, but it's also fairly easy to just select stuff and then hit tab. As long as you're not using spaces for indents. <laughs> That that I, I have strong opinions on. I, I can't get behind spaces for indents because that just seems like... Because then you go to like delete a tab and you're like... Wonder <laughs> oh, by the way, I have the ridiculous coding add-on here. That's why everything's uh, going crazy. That's the other fun thing about Godot is that you can add add-ons to the editor like this that actually shake the screen and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, uh, this one, I'm going to go ahead and rename this here so I don't get confused. And then we're going to start a completely new vehicle from scratch. We'll see how this goes. So, new scene. Um, hmm, trying to decide if I want the body of it to be a character body or just the wheels might be good to have a character body in the whole thing we'll do that so we'll start off with the character body 3d and then we need to add a collision shape for that We'll just put a capsule on here. Rotate that, like that. We'll call this steam cycle. We'll drag our blend file in here. Then we're gonna add a. N mm. Actually, I guess if I've got a character body on this whole thing. Maybe we just do some shape casts. Call that good enough. How does a computer understand code? Uh, well, there's <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on to kind of take the um, the text, parse it, and then convert it into instructions. But ultimately, it, it takes all the text and then compiles it down. There's, there's a few different stages to kind of break it down. Um, but ultimately, at least in the case of compiled code, it gets down to machine code. And then that machine code then gets sent to the, um, the processor. And that, processor operates on those instructions or typically it goes through the operating system and libraries and whatnot and then those instructions um, can make things show up on the screen or whatever but in the case of something like GDScript it's actually a scripting language so that gets parsed and turned into basically it reads those um lines of code and I think it has like an intermediate like optimized sort of instruction set so it's not literally parsing the text as it's executing but then those uh, basically there's some code that goes through and then checks the instructions and then based on those instructions it will execute functions on the engine and then the engine stuff is what ends up doing those opcodes that the processor uh, executes Let's see, how long have I been live? 
Okay, we've been live for an hour. I'm going to, I'm like out of water here, so I'm gonna take a quick little stretch break and grab some water and I'll be back in a couple minutes. What is this AFK sound command here? Work here? Oh, doesn't work. <laughs> I'd have to do that on my own channel, I think. I've got a bunch of sound commands on my own channel, but After there we go. Stretches, <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Little stretch break. All right. Okay, so let's uh, see what we can make happen here. I think I'm gonna push the model down. Maybe we'll just sort of extend this out a bit. So basically the wheels will be ultimately driving it. And then We'll just have the collision shape there, just to have it. <laughs> That's my inspiration for the game, Kook. Uh, it's mostly Quake. I grew up playing and modding Quake and Quake 2 and some of the other Quakes too. Custom shader templates are starting to work well now. Nice. Can you appear on the glass plane? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have to go to <laughs> you have to go to you uh to my Twitch channel and say something there, and then it should pop up. <laughs> I couldn't. Uh, 
I don't actually have like full OAuth access to the server, so I couldn't connect it to this. Emotions. Hmm. Big thing is fun, but uh, maybe maybe a little bit of fear and excitement. <laughs> There we go. Now we're getting some people show up. I should probably like host. Wait, can I host from here? I don't know if that actually did anything. All right, so let's, um, hmm. There's a little exhaust pipe right here. Wasn't sure where best to put it, so I'll put it there. <laughs> Yeah, I need to get some steam particles. Yep. And then these are the engines there. Hooked directly up to the wheel. Kind of maybe went a little overboard with the details on this thing. But, yeah, I want it to look cool. I want people to see that and be like, oh man, I want to ride that around. What a high poly model for a low poly game, yeah. Have I tried putting the steam particles in the valve? <laughs> Not yet. Now we just have the mesh, and uh, that's about it here. Although I did do some UV unwrapping, except for that. I just added that. That's not UV unwrapped yet. Just ignore that. The rest of it. Wait. There we go. The rest of it's packed in there pretty well. <laughs> Goodness. Okay, there were a lot of a lot of parts here. Ah, whatever. <laughs> oh, it's not even in that mode. That's why it wasn't deselecting those things. Anyway, sorry, getting distracted here. Um, well, let's see. I think what we want to do. We're going to add a couple markers that are going to indicate where the wheels should be. Call it wheel back and give it a unique name thing, and then we will position that about there. Doesn't need to be super exact, but. All right, now we will create a script. Oh, let's save this thing first. To our vehicles, steam cycle. And we'll add a script. How horrified you've been if any artist gave you those models 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah. How much do I want to punch something just un by unwrapping a model? It's not too bad. So I was working on this earlier today. Um, so I've got a few add-ons that sort of make it sort of helpful. So like this, and I haven't 
marked all of these seams yet. If I kind of mark them as I go, it's a little less painful. So then we can select all these, because this is the stuff that's not properly unwrapped yet. And then we hit unwrap, and then I can see that that is, that's clearly busted. So what I do is I select the sync UV selection, and then I can click on that, and then I can move it around over here and be like, oh, that's, that's what's broken. Okay, we need some seams here. In fact, might make more sense to clear those seams and instead do it like this. And then we unwrap. And then I've got this thing called uh, UV Packer. So you can see Blender by default, it makes it uses like rectangles for the islands, so we've got gaps there. But then we use this UV Packer, and everything is a lot more tightly packed. Um, and if you're doing like high res textures, that's probably good enough. But since I'm doing pixel art stuff, I'm gonna have to go in and pick the resolution and kind of texel density, and then try to snap all of these to the pixels on the texture or at least the ones that are kind of apparent because it looks bad if you've got, especially if you've got stuff at weird angles like these, then it's, then you've just got like pixel art textures at arbitrary angles on things like the seat and stuff. And it's like, now you got to straighten all that out. So that, that ends up taking a lot of time. But if you're not doing that, if you're doing high res textures, it's not so bad. All right. See you later, Mux. Yeah, Dav, it's a nice, uh, nice middle ground where it's like I'm, I'm using low poly as the aesthetic and not a requirement. So as long as it's got, like I have things, like each individual component of this kind of looks low poly. Like, you know, these are only like four-sided pipes and whatnot. But there's just a lot of details. So each individual detail is fairly low poly. Like, you know, that's... This spring damping system is only it's only four sided, but it's amongst a whole bunch of other details and like the handlebars are only six sided and whatnot. So the whole thing is less than three thousand triangles, barely less than three thousand, but less than three thousand. <laughs> so it's not like you know modern game assets that have hundreds of thousands of triangles. But uh, for those curious about the workflow going back and forth between Blender and Godot, all I have to do is save this. And then when I go back over to Godot, it's going to re-import the assets here. Because what you do is you go into your project setting. Or no, actually, this is an editor settings. You go to editor settings. And then uh, if you just search for Blender, just type Blender in there under file system import. You can set the blender path to wherever blender is installed. And then once that is set, all you have to do is drop your .blend files or just save your blend files directly into your Godot project. And then it will, behind the scenes, fire up blender, export it as GLTF, and import it uh, using the Godot GLTF importer. Making a realistic physics based bike is really hard indeed. <laughs> Do not use the 4.1 version of Blender. That's what I'm using. What's wrong with it? Yeah, Gu Guzzi, it's really incredible how powerful computers are these days. 
Like, you can put so many polygons into things. There's... The caveat is, due to the way the rendering works, is you really want to avoid overdraw, which is where you have, like, especially transparent polygons drawing on top of each other. And you want to avoid um, polygons that are too small. Because if you have... The way the rendering works, if, if you've got, a, like, a really small triangle, um, the renderer will break things up. So if you've got if you got a large triangle and these are some pixels, it works in groups of four. So because it, it, it can do it can calculate the derivatives between things and it's used for things like um, anastropic filtering and some other stuff. So whenever it renders, it renders in groups of four. So the more surface area you have on a triangle the better. Because when you get on these edges, especially if you've got a really small triangle like this, like these boxes here are not even on the triangle, but it might have to calculate the render as though they are. So if you have like a bunch of really densely packed tiny triangles, like I think the you want to aim for around eight pixels per triangle or something like that, because once you start getting smaller than that, it can actually impact your performance more than having higher poly but larger triangle meshes. The, the optimization of things in 3D rendering these days is not exactly intuitive. Oh, the vertex color stuff. Yeah, yeah. I ran into that. Um, what was it I ran into? It wasn't a vertex color, it was the uh, vertex groups. Like, if you try to merge two meshes together, you end up losing the vertex groups. Although that's that's been a problem for a while. Yeah, I, I haven't been using vertex colors on this, so I guess I haven't noticed that. What does I will count my lucky stars mean? Um, that's just like a, an old saying. It's like, you know, if if some if you were lucky, you know, something something happened and you survived a crash or something like that. It's like oh, I'll count my lucky stars. Yeah, be grateful for your good luck. That's that's probably the best way to describe it, Gizia. I've seen any engine slash blender connection like being able to highlight the current game camera position in a blender map. Hmm. I don't know. There's um There's a humble bundle that has sort of a blender godot add-on thing. I'm not sure what all that entails. I think it's on humble bundle right now. But Maybe that could be useful. So squares are usually better for topology workflow. Uh, but ultimately, when it gets put into a game, they all get turned into triangles anyway. So generally, it's good to use quads or squares where you can, where it makes sense, but you shouldn't obsess over them so much that you're making your mesh actually less optimal by adding a whole bunch of extra quads just to maintain quads. <laughs> Some people get like really crazy about that. Oh, sorry. Here. <laughs> it's not so bright anymore. I'll stop sharing my bright ideas. Okay, let's get started on the steam cycle here. Um, so a cool thing you can do with Godot and GDScript is you can click on something in the scene and you can drag it over and then hold control when you let go and it will automatically create an on ready variable 
with the type and everything. Spe well, I think the type specification is a editor setting. So we want variables for the front and back wheel there. And we also need a physics process. Like I was talking about earlier, I'm going to have the actual vehicle system process this. So we're going to call this process uh, steam cycle. Pass in ourself with the delta. No, some people get like almost religi religiously fanatical about quads. And the thing with quads is it's it's more of a workflow thing because when you have quads I'll open another instance of blender and chase so if we do like a cylinder and if we have see this is all made of quads except for the ends but we're, we're just going to ignore those for now and now if i hit control r i can create an edge loop here and that just goes around the whole thing and you know you can shift that around modify it however you want to and then if i hold down alt and left click or right click if you're using right click select then you can select that whole edge loop but as soon as you start introducing some triangles in there so now let's say we've got some triangles here um and when i try to well actually that's still an edge loop uh Okay, yeah. So if I try to if I try to do an edge loop now here, since we've introduced that kind of funky geometry, um, that may not exactly be doing what I want it to do. So then your workflow starts getting crazy. And the other reason is if you're doing subdivision modeling. So if I've got a plane that's a quad, and then I add a modifier on here. And we look at that in the wireframe. Oh, I guess you don't see it in the wireframe. <laughs> um, but a quad, actually, here, let's just do this as a regular subdivide, because that's easier to see. So if we do this and I would have to do it. Wait. Okay, yeah, if we subdivide this, we can see the the quad turns into four quads. If we subdivide this, which is effectively the same thing for rendering, but not for subdividing, because when we subdivide that, wait, let me switch that. All right. Um, hmm. Okay, I guess the subdivide in here behaves differently because normally it subdivides it into quads. I think when you do the modifier subdivide, it subdivides it into quads. Sorry, this is, I was not expecting that. Okay, yeah, the subdivision modifier. Turns it into six quads. Normally you have the subdivision modifier on there and that is used to kind of smooth things out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's more optimal to keep quads, but sometimes people will add a whole bunch of extra geometry to add quads and those quads actually end up adding more geometry than just having a triangle in there. So you gotta be smart about it.
Anyway, I should probably focus on more Godot stuff since we're streaming on the Godot channel. On my on my normal Chitspo channel, I uh, do all kinds of development stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not familiar with any game engines that actually do anything different with quads versus two triangles. The only thing I'm aware of is for actual like rendering engines, which can somehow do some stuff to reduce like texture distortion and such. But most of the time, if you're doing like cinematic renders, it's so high poly anyway that it almost seems sort of a moot point. All right. Um, okay, so now we need to go into our vehicle system. Probably close all this other stuff here. If they're actively watching it. Some of them might be. So what we want to do is, I guess, do a sh oh, we should probably add some options for. Uh, so one thing I like about Godot here. Let me just put this here. We'll come back to that later. Um, if you want a variable, oh wait, I forgot the app. If you want a variable that you can edit, you just do export var, and then you can be like uh, fill size, and that will just be like I don't know. 1.0 to start with. Or maybe not size, but wheel radius. That might be a little more straightforward. Oh, and this needs to extend vehicle. And it's going to be class name. Steam cycle. This is why I try to type everything because then it was, you see Godot was yelling at me for trying to pass in a parameter that was not actually a valid parameter. There we go, now it's happy. So, um, the colon specifies the type, and I could either do explicitly type float, which will make it a float, or if you just do colon without specifying the type, then it will infer the type based on what you assign it here. So if you put 1.0, then it's going to be a floating point value. Um, so now if we look over here. We can see the wheel radius is that. So we want to adjust that to like 0.8 or whatever, then we can do that. Uh, 
All right, so. Oh. Oh, I just use this map to test. Because oh, we'll use this one. It's fine. Alright, so I'm going to drag our new steam cycle in. And this one's not going to do anything yet. Actually, maybe I should color them so that I know which one's which. Uh... We'll just put some bricks on that. <laughs> that way we know that that one is the one that is not um, the one we should be using. So there's a visual distinction between the two. It'll probably be obvious just from looking at it. The <laughs> one that's going crazy is a physics based one. So we got this thing here. It is just just sitting there. Doesn't do anything yet. Um, but let's see. A few things we should do. Should probably set up the collision. I set that up as a player. Hmm. I wonder if I need if I should add a different collision for the vehicle. Use that. This was an add on that uh, Handers made, by the way. You can just do uh, groups so you don't have to remember all the things for each different type of thing you've got, enemies and whatnot. Um, I think it's just sort of been slowly growing, and then it's kind of hit the, like, um, what's the, what's the term for it? When you go, when you go past a certain threshold, my mind is blanking out here. <laughs> critical mass. Yeah, I think it's kind of just finally hit critical mass. Where it's, um, you know, enough. Because I, I feel like one of the problems with Godot in the past was that there just weren't that many people creating tutorials and stuff for it. So when you go to make a video game, you see all these resources out there for other engines. And then you hop on those and it's sort of like a snowball effect. So now Godot is, is kind of catching up as far as the community goes. And then it's sort of exploded. And just a lot more people have discovered it and realized the potentials 
that it has. Because when I started with Godot, not a whole lot of people were really talking about it. going to copy some stuff from here and delete most of it but we need to check if we have a player on it um, figure out the gas break in the left right if we have gas uh, we'll just do velocity Let's see, do I want the Excel? I guess we could put some of this stuff on the base vehicle. I don't know if I'm going to have any other vehicles in this game. I guess we'll just put it all on Steam Cycle, and then if we have other vehicles, then we can pull off the generic stuff that's shared. So we need a variable for how much we can accelerate. Um, I don't know, we'll just put that at like 20 for now. And max speed. Yeah, yeah, the turnaround time, the iteration time on Godot is what I really liked. It's like how quickly you get up and running. You just download an executable, run it, boom. Save some scenes, run it. You can stop after that. It look like Fall Guys, I guess. I think these uh, characters were made before Fall Guys, though. The only one he used. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous coding is pretty, uh, pretty fun. I guess maybe you could do something where you like use the Godot editor to write code for another engine with the effects and stuff? I don't know. Kind of like how some people use, you know, other editors to write code for Godot. Uh, oh, I didn't save this. Oh, wait. Vehicle dot velocity. There we go. 
so I'm not operating directly on the vehicle here. Okay, this is just going to be a really dumb thing where we <laughs> ultimately got to check for on the ground and such. Uh, but just going to get some very, very basic stuff going here. Not sure how this is going to go. What does delta time mean? That is the amount of time it took for the, in this case, it's the physics frame. If you're using the process function, it is the render frame. But you normally have to multiply things by delta so that they're not frame rate dependent. Oh. I want this. This is just temple logic. You want sleep? It can be very elusive. Good luck. this I need to put on a rig group <clears throat> excuse me steam cycle so we can interact with it and get onto it for they to be a tad bit less noisy <coughs> I guess I could drop the volume down Uh, you can use the sit command. I don't know if there's actually a lay down command though. Oops. Ah, oh, whoops. <laughs> I things had crashed. Okay. What did I, what did I do here? Oh yeah, we don't have a player attached. Uh, I copied the other stuff, but I didn't copy that. I do have stepping logic in Kook, and ramps um, are used to, I mean, you can gain momentum, upward momentum running up ramps. Turn full screen off so that if we have errors, it doesn't get stuck. Um, so yeah, we got we got ramps here, and 
you can see the stepping logic behaving there. Oh, you're wondering if I used ramps instead of, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Yes. I mean, I use both. We have, we do have ramps and we have steps, but the steps, I actually do like an upward over and down cast and see if that's walkable. And then, um, teleport the, the physics body upward and then counter teleports the, uh, the camera and the mesh and everything down and then blend it up so that when you step over things, it doesn't just pop up. There's actually a bit of a blend. So when you step onto things, it's not like super janky. But yeah, you can see, so step onto these books and such. Okay, um, interesting. It seems the player is not colliding. Wait, 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 wait. Does mask. I wonder where the other one. Oh, you know what? We need interact trigger. Wait, no, the layer should be interact trigger as well. I'm curious. Oh, this one did have interact. Okay, okay. That's how that worked. You don't know what I meant by what? Ah, right. I need a player position on this as well. For it. Uh, so we need to specify where the player is going to attach on the vehicle. Hey, Godfather. Oh, so. Imagine we've got a step here. And this is our character controller. So when we move along, what we need to do is we check. So we hit something here. So do a cast up, over, and back down. And it's like, cool, that's a walkable surface. So we actually teleport. Basically, the physics instantly goes up here. So the next frame, you can move along the ground. But if we have the camera and the character mesh and all that just move along with it, it's going to be very jarring every time you hit a step. So basically what I do is we have our, so we teleport this up, but then we keep like the character, <laughs> just draw him down to the crappy stick man. We keep him down here and then slowly blend upward to catch up with the, uh, well, not necessarily slowly, but you know, we blend upward so it's not an instant pop. But since the mesh is actually a child of the, uh, the physics body, in my case, we actually have to move the mesh down. And then as we update, we, slowly blend it back up or blend it back up over a period of time yeah yeah it's um it's not a straight lerp i've got some other kind of damping algorithm i think because the lerp tends to look very linear but it's still better than popping so yeah you can do a lerp Although the problem with lerping is that you're lerping 
So you might have a lerp between, you know, a lerp to cover this distance. But as you're lerping, you hit the next step. So it's like you basically need an algorithm that's going to catch this up. And so it it catches up more the further away it is. So like if you if you go up a bunch of steps very rapidly, it's going to move up faster. Just shift things around a little bit here. Okay. So we need to specify a player position. I can probably just copy this off of here. Boop. Well, sort of. It's a little bit offset. Close enough. All right, let's see if we can get on this thing now. Yeah, yeah. So the there is a I do have a full character mesh. You really only see the arms and legs of it. Um. But yeah, that's all a child of the character body, which is the physics that moves around. Okay. No, no, we're on the vehicle. It's not actually doing anything yet because I set the velocity, but I don't actually move it. <laughs> so we need to do Let's do a move and oh wait no vehicle to move and slide. Uh, you can change your monitor's resolution with AMD. Oh right, move and slide takes move and collide takes the offset. Move and slide is just the velocity. Yeah, I I don't act like I have the character mesh attached to the camera. So if you look down, your legs you never actually see your legs. But I have the legs so that we can have like a kick animation. So you can kick and you can see the legs there and you can punch, see the arms. Okay, so now we got... The hover bike, because there's no gravity. <laughs> but we got some progress. Uh, yeah, I would still use Jolt. Where's Rocket 2? It's not done yet. By the way, um, I'm bad about self-promoting, so I should probably promote 
my game here. Oh, actually, I think you can just type projects. Like it's a link to it. There it is. Yeah. So if you want to check out the uh, Steam page and stuff, I'm going to take a short break here and go to the bathroom and get some water and such. Uh, but I'll be back in a few minutes here. After these stretches, <laughs> we'll be right, right back. back. All right. Let's see. What are the advantages of using jolts? Um, it tends to be a lot more stable, like a lot less getting stuck and the performance is a bit better. In some cases, quite a bit better. <laughs> it just exports a DLL file. At some point, I want to see if I can actually compile it into the engine that I'm using because I do a custom compiled build so we can not have external DLLs. I'm hoping that it ends up just becoming an official thing like officially part of Godot. Because then that just makes it a lot easier to debug and profile and all that kind of stuff if it's all built into this engine. Because Godot 3 had a third-party physics engine 
called Bullet that was built in, and you could switch between the Godot physics and the Bullet physics. Um, but for Godot 4, they decided to pull that out, pull Bullet out, and just use the Godot physics, but there's... I find the... I think the 2D physics are okay, but the 3D Godot physics can be very problematic. There's a lot of places where you can just like get stuck and um, have performance issues and whatnot, so I feel like to ship a game it's almost a, a must to use Jolt right now. Because even if it's rare, you don't want players getting stuck somewhere and not being able to continue the game. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm trying to decide what we should do next. Actually, before we do anything here, let's just show off some of the other stuff that I've been working on. Uh, it tends to be problems with the actual collision, like, resolution, from my understanding. So sometimes, you know, if you collide with the geometry that's just a certain configuration, it doesn't know how to resolve that collision, and then the player, like, the character body just gets stuck there and you physically can't move anymore. Hey, Adam. Thank you. Snicko. Hello. Yeah, the other thing that I was thinking of doing for this stream was working on this uh, Sewer Swan. So, I've got the model for it pretty much done, but I need to, I want to have some special AI for it to where it can, like, dive out of the water and uh, kind of do some, like, aerial attack or something crazy. But I think the the physics, the vehicle physics is probably going to take up more than the whole stream. You guys probably have to come back to my channel tomorrow if you want to go want to see the uh, continuation of that. Hey, what's up, 12 feet up? Um, I mean, there's nothing inherent in the Godot physics that handles stairs. So, like, I, I built my own stair-stepping logic. Here. Let me actually grab a gun here so I can shoot some stuff. This is a nice boomstick. Oh, yeah, that, that's got a bit of a bug. <laughs> you can use one barrel, or you can use all three. <laughs> For bigger enemies. That's a boomstick. There's actually a bunch of uh, different weapons. We got a kind of basic pistol, shotgun, got a nine barreled rifle. Also has a bayonet melee. Uh, let's see. Flamethrower. Probably not the most effective thing to be using right there. And then we got some work in progress stuff like the. Grenade launcher. This is gonna. Oh yeah, there's there's alt fires on these things too. Well, the, you saw the uh, shotgun in that one, but the flamethrower has an alt fire that's like a almost like a jet 
engine type thing. So you can use it to push enemies back. Or you can use it to push yourself back. It's not quite enough to fly forever, but you can go... You can go a good distance with it. The drop kick. Uh... find some physics objects. I don't have much in the way of physics objects on this map. I think I've got some in this building here. Yeah. There's a book here. So you can pick up stuff. You can drop stuff. You can kick stuff. Well, if I'm not standing on top of it, you can kick it. There it goes. <laughs> you can kick stuff. So therefore, you can drop kick things. <laughs> Get a little extra distance out of them. Random shotgun shell is still bouncing around down there. There we go. That guy. Oh yeah, and there's also a rocket launcher. These are obviously working. Oh, I didn't show off. All right, I, I failed to show off the coolest weapon. Uh. This one's more fun if you got a group of enemies. Because it creates a time distortion bubble. And then you can take your time and fire a bunch of spikes at him. <laughs> this guy doesn't have a proper wall pinning animation, but um, some of the enemies are set up so that you can pin them to the walls. I just need to add that to all the enemies. They need a, a specific wall pinning animation. Oh, and the other thing that's cool with it is um, you can jump on the spikes. Well, <laughs> so say I wanted to get up here, can't make it up here. I can split, put a spike on the wall. Now I can jump up there. A little, a little makeshift ladder. There we go. You want to see it in VR? I feel like the fast-paced movement of a retro FPS might be a little bit vomit-inducing on VR. But, could be worth trying. Are there 192 people watching? Holy cow. I haven't even been paying attention to how many people are online. Oh, nice. Inspiration from the Actually, I commissioned um, the art for that. Here, I'll show you. That that's the concept art for it. It's made by Kaya's Cosmos, spelled with K. Fitting, like kook. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of my shell a little bit with this project and actually uh, work with other people. <laughs> I tend to be more of a solo dev, but uh, I saw some of the art that Kaya was doing and I was like, that would be really cool in kook, so... I commissioned some... Uh, Smart for that. Sorry, I, I'm reading chat out of order here. <laughs> but yeah, this is Kook. Um, there is there's a link to my projects, a couple of my projects anyway. Zoomer, I think a port might be worth it. Trying to do a large-scale VR exclusive game is still... Because, like, even the most popular games on VR don't make a... I mean, I don't know. 
Something like Beat Saber probably did pretty well. But it's it's kind of VR is an interesting market because it's kind of niche and there's people that are looking for VR titles that have VR headsets. So if you make a good game for VR, it's liable to do pretty well. It's just that even if it does well for that market, um, like as a, a small indie studio, you could probably get by with it. But if you're trying to do like a like a big studio making a project for it, it'd probably be pretty difficult to be uh, profitable. Uh, the console is an add-on that I made, but if you just go to the asset library and search for developer console, um, you can throw it in your project super easily. And then all you have to do is go into your scripts and just do um, console.add command. So see, I've got this like crosshair command, and then you specify the number of parameters. So if I run the game, yeah, but Half-Life Alex was done to sell. They were basically using that to sell the hardware. Like that's that's kind of a case of like um, you know the first titles that come out for a console or whatever. So yeah, I can type cross here zero, and then that'll turn that off, and cross here one turns it on. So really, really simple to just add your project, at least for basic commands. I don't have things like console variables and stuff, like a full-blown Quake console, but um, probably wouldn't be too difficult to add that if there's a desire for it. Yeah, the biggest problem with VR, I think, is just the comfort level. Like wearing a big, heavy headset. I mean, they've come a long way. But still, anything heavier than like a pair of glasses is almost uncomfortable for more than a couple hours. So there's not people that are just like doing a lot of VR stuff for an excessive period of time. Like, I've got a VR headset, and I hardly ever use it, because it's just, like, the hassle of bringing it out and hooking it up and setting up the sensors and stuff, because I don't have a, like, good permanent spot to keep everything. So, I mostly don't play VR games. VR dev is really exhausting, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's just... It's it's a tough technological hurdle to make it um, like viable to be comfortable wearing that for an extended period of time. <laughs> Here's a better example of the the time vampire. There we go. Uh, you can you can pin these guys to the wall. It's fun. You can even pin them to something and then have that thing move. even slows you down as well. <laughs> I 
Okay. Um... Is there a way to disable it for release? Um, yeah, I'd plan to keep it in the game like Quake does. But yeah, if you want to disable it on release, I was planning to add something. I'm not sure how you would, what the best place to put settings would be. I guess you could just put it in the, like, in your code. I don't know that I have like a disable function. I should probably add like a disable, then we could do um, Yeah, I guess I don't have anything to disable it. You'd have to manually add some stuff in there. But we could do something. We like that funk disable. Then I'll actually add the variable. <laughs> so then we could do something like I forgot the thing you check if it's released or not, if it's in a release build or not. It's a debug build. Yeah, it is debug build. Okay. Maybe it would be better to have that check in the console itself, and then we could say something like that. And then you don't have to think about it. <laughs> Maybe that should default to false. Ah, I don't know why my computer's lagging so much. It's not it's not Godot, it's something weird with my computer. I guess we could just kind of skip 
everything. So it's not the release build. It's not debug build. Although this is going to get called first. So no, we probably need to do this. Uh, we'll just do... We'll set enable to false. Make the expert pro. Oh, I, mm, I think it's probably easier if it's just a release build thing. How do I search functions like that? Uh, you just go to the search help, and then you start typing. You can also hold down control and then left click on things, and it'll bring you directly to the function. It's really nice having all this documentation built right into the Godot engine so you don't even have to open up a web browser or anything. It's like so much stuff is just right there. Yeah, I mean, that's a, probably a fairly common use case, though. I'm just not sure if it should be enabled in release by default or not. Because, you know, if people are using it to test things that would be, like... You know, they don't want people, I don't know. My thinking is just let people do whatever. Like, they're probably going to do stuff with the game anyway. <laughs> like, um, so having that in there. Like, I guess it might be good to have a... Yeah, that might not be a bad idea, though. Oh, if you could add it as an export setting. So when you go to export, because maybe you want to have the console on Windows, but you don't want to have the console on, I don't know, Android or some other platform or something for some reason. I mean, you could go over and type it on my channel. Yeah, it's the only way to get your avatars up on the stream is to <gasps> go over here. <laughs> Wait, did you even show up there, Booyah Grandma? Oh, there you are. Behind my head. Hiding. So, yeah, let's for a second pretend. that that is off. Well, we'll explicitly set it to false for now. And then we'll just say um, we'll just pretend oops that's not the right kind of comment here. 
We'll pretend it's the debug build or the release builds. So now, hypothetically, nope, I did it wrong. Wait. Oh, because I checked this on ready. Uh... Oh, I know what we can do. We can just do a set equals I made a function just to disable, right? Yeah. All right, we'll have an enable and disable. You have to understand. Yeah, I mean, I figure I might as well just update it. Although I don't know why. It, oh, I think the toggle checks something wrong here. Let's step through this real quick. It's a good. It's a good simple thing to do to just kind of show people how easy it is to work with Godot. So enabled is false. So we're gonna hit F11, step in here, and oh right, I did this backward. If it's enabled, we toggle it. If it's not enabled, then yeah, so I just messed up that logic. Now I don't know if saving it and then stepping through will, yeah, I don't think that's gonna work. You can actually modify the code while it's running, but I think it had already executed past a point where that was not gonna work. Okay, so now when I hit the tilde key, nothing happens. So what we're going to do... Let's change that to true. Do a quick test. Make sure this behaves the way expected. Okay, now we can use console. And now change that back to checking if it's a debug build. I'm not going to bother doing an export and everything. I might do that later. But all right. Then I can. Uh, Put an update to the console to have that check in there. But yeah, it's fairly easy to modify the code. I mean, it's. I tried to make it as straightforward as possible. There was. When I first got into Godot, I got some console add on, and it was so over engineered. There were like 100 files, and there was like. Each file was like a thing you know, like different types and stuff. And it's just like, what? This is so complicated. You just throw this, this could just be one script. <laughs> Let that boy kook. But yeah, that's one thing I really love about Godot is how easy it is to make add-ons and other things. Just whip up some GD script really quickly and boom. 
Good to go. I really like the way it's designed to be basically as minimal as possible. Hardly any boilerplate stuff. Like, you just you throw a script on something and it is just by you don't have to define a class it like is a class and then if you need to use that class somewhere else you can optionally specify that class name so that you can use it to type things or whatever you might need to do but if you don't you don't just it's like this main scene is a class but I don't, nothing nothing needs to reference main scene as a class name, so it just kind of sits here. Oh, that's another thing you, with the console is you can connect signals for the console open and console closed. So if you want to do things like, um, you know, change the mouse mode or what have you. There's another thing I wanted in there. Ah, well, I don't know. I'm getting too distracted by the, the console stuff. Let's just close that. See if we can make some progress on the Steam cycle here. My streams tend to be very miscellaneous streams because it's just like... I find it's a lot easier usually to just address... If you see some little thing, it's easier to just address it there and do it rather than like, you know, set up a task and um, plan it out. Maybe it's not the most optimal for getting things done, but if something needs to get done at some point anyway, might as well just do it. Unless there's something really critical that you have to get done by a certain deadline. Then it becomes a little more difficult to balance things. But yeah, once again, if anybody wants to use that uh, console add-on, just go... All you have to do is click on the asset lib and search for... Actually, search for console. There's a few different ones on here. Mine is the developer console. And then someone's made a C-sharp version of it. Um, if you're using C-sharp code, which may be better. I don't know. Looks like several other people have made uh, console versions. Various versions of consoles. Some of them are a lot more advanced. Mine is like kind of the bare minimum. <laughs> I think some of them might be based on the one that I wrote. That's a great thing about MIT. People can just go in and modify it to their needs. Do whatever you want. I think MIT... I'm not really sure MIT versus Apache, which is better if it really makes a difference. They both seem about the same. Just like, I'm not a fan of the GPL license though. It's like if you use anything that has the GPL license, then all of your stuff has to be released under the GPL license, and sometimes it's just not compatible with various libraries and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of times like just doing the simplest implementation, and then as you need things, you add them, but. Sometimes people will try to over-engineer things for every possible use case. And that can be important if you're making like a tool for other people to use, but for your own projects, just like pff, knock out the simplest thing possible. And then as you need it, all the tools for your own projects, so that, that's a difficult thing to balance, right? Because the more powerful the tool is, the better it is to have early on but also it takes a lot of time to build that tool, which means you're not spending that time on the things that you actually need in the game. Like, so you're spending a bunch of stuff for like, maybe this will potentially make things better in the future. It's hard to balance that. It's a little bit easier when you're working on a really big project and it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna be working on this for a while so having this really good tooling is going to help speed things up Cause another tool that I've got is um, the BSP oops BSP importer so that's set up so that I can use trench broom 
and we can just like build a level here. So trench broom makes it really easy to just block stuff out like this. So save that, compile it, and then once everything's configured, it is a little more complicated to set up than the uh, than the console. But now I can open this and we've got this little level here. Or part of a level anyway. But for this you have to set up all this, the mappings for the textures and such and the entity remaps and such. Because I tried to make it as generic as possible. So you can use kind of Quake style entities, but they have to map to some scene that gets imported. So the initial setup can be a little time consuming. So you got to set up templates for your water and lava and slime if you're using those. And um, potentially you can rename or remap materials, otherwise you can set up a pattern. So like I've got, you know, everything's in material slash texture name underscore material dot TRES. So all this stuff here, these are all the different materials. Got some brick and concrete and stuff. <laughs> all with kind of funky names because the, the name length is limited to like 12 characters or something. But yeah, once you get all that stuff set up, then it's just a matter of basically doing what I did there, and you just compile it, and then you can, uh, you can either put the entities in in Trench Broom or um, in Godot. So I tend to find it easier to just do most of the stuff in Godot as far as entities go. Anyway, that would have been good, potentially a, a good uh, stream to do as well. Do some level design, although that's spending a lot of time outside of Godot. I figured it'd be good to do stuff that's more programming within Godot. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know. If it's freedom that's forced freedom, then it's not really freedom. It's kind of ironic that the, you know, trying to force everything to be free ended up being the most restrictive license just about... <laughs> I guess it could have potentially been written in a way that allowed other libraries and such. Like I understand why they did it the way they did so that you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to just take, I'm going to use this free open source thing and then put all my stuff in a library. Although honestly, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem that bad. Like at least the core thing is going to get some updates. The way I see it now, the GPL is kind of like this license that you use to release commercial software that is open source, but you want people to pay for. So things like the, the QT library, where it's like, well, actually that's LGPL, so it's not quite as bad, but um, you guys kind of like, well, if you don't if you don't want to use the LGPL license, you can pay for the commercial license, and then you can just compile all the the UI stuff directly into your executable. But it's definitely some nice for some things. 
like Blender where it's like, okay, you don't have to worry about anybody ever going and taking Blender and then like closed sourcing it or something like that because the GPL just doesn't <gasps> allow for that. I think where it shines is for tooling because then it guarantees the tools will stay open source. But when it comes to like games and other projects, it's very problematic. Uh, let's see. So, Steam Cycle stuff. Yeah, we should do that. Um, how do we want to handle this? I guess what we do, yeah, I was thinking of doing a, um, basically do a sphere for each wheel. probably like diagram this out sorry for the flashbang here let's do this we'll fill it with like a dark color and then oh. <laughs> then we can draw on a light color still got a bit of flashbang on the borders but hopefully that's not so bad so we're gonna have kind of the main body of the bike and then we're gonna have the wheel bodies probably somewhere around there I don't know um, but those are actually not gonna be bodies per se they're just gonna be there and then they're just gonna be sphere cast that we do so we're gonna do uh, sphere cast I guess I could do a shape cast. Uh, I've actually got a helper function that lets me do like sphere cast without having to do this. But for the vehicle, it might make more sense to actually just put the sphere cast on the vehicle. Gosh, I spend too much time thinking about things and not actually doing anything. So let's just do this. Trying to decide if I want to set up a class that's going to be. Yeah, maybe we'll just do a, a wheel class. Keep it wheel. And that's going to have a.
Yeah, it might make sense to have the shape cast just built into them. So, shape cast. And then we will have. Eh. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm not gonna bother with this until we have a vehicle that has more than two wheels. Because right now it's like we have the wheel that drives and the wheel that steers. I was thinking of setting up an array of wheels and doing all this complicated stuff, but I may only ship the game with just the steam cycle. That goes back to our previous conversation, just implement it in the simplest way possible. And then if you need more, then you can go back and if I add a four-wheeled vehicle or something like that, then we can do something with that. I mean, lowers productivity is not necessarily true because it helps for me. I mean, maybe for like a neurotypical person it helps or it's um, it's more optimal not to stream. But for me, it's kind of like having a body double because if there's people watching me, I'm actually sitting down and like trying to solve the problems as opposed to Otherwise, I might just be scrolling through Twitter or watching random junk on YouTube or something like that. And it's just, next thing I know, four hours is gone and I've done absolutely nothing. Rubber ducks in the NSA in one. Yeah, so. Just being live streaming, I think, helps me get stuff done. My chat doesn't troll. Really? <laughs> Have you hung out in my streams? This is eerily quiet compared to my usual streams. <laughs> but, look here, right? tabs, a lot of the tabs I have open are things I need to do at some point anyway, so at least I'm getting stuff done. Easy to get more stuff done on the side. Well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, it's not, like, a one-size-fits-all thing. Having some streamer in the, doing game dev in the background helps you endure programming all day? Nice. Yeah, I, I'm the opposite. I have a hard time, like, having a streamer on in the background. Because I want to sit there and, like, chat with them or see what they're doing or whatever. And it's hard for me to actually get my own stuff done. So I don't spend a whole lot of time watching streams. But I'm very glad that I can help motivate people get stuff done because I don't I don't know how people focus when they're doing that. When I'm doing all the crazy stuff that I'm doing and we've got crazy effects going on and sound commands and all the other chaos that's normally going on in the stream. But if that helps you, awesome. Yeah, it's win-win. Uh, let's see. So we need to do a shape cast. Okay, so oh, well, that's why I was wanted to set up the classes for the wheels because I was going to do like the front wheel velocity and the back wheel velocity. Mm.
if that's the only thing we need, then just having those as variables. It's kind of yucky, but if it gets the job done, <laughs> you're already dropping cubes in here. <laughs> Speaking of the chaos on my stream. Yeah, I got a bunch of different things you can redeem and whatnot. Keep people entertained while I'm staring at program nonsense that I can't figure out. Gotcha. Yeah, I've had days like that where it's like it gets you going and then a lot of it is just the getting over that initial hurdle of starting to do something because sometimes you just don't feel like doing it but if you've got a set schedule where you stream you know it's like every day I'm going to start streaming at 7pm or whatever and then even if you don't feel like it you get started you get going you start getting some momentum and then sometimes even after stream you still feel like being productive Um, let's see. Okay, so we've got the wheel back velocity, wheel front velocity. So what we're going to do is... So we'll do this over here. So So maybe we'll just start with the wheel back and then um, we'll add in steering later. <laughs> so first thing we need to do is we need to add the uh, gravity. Ooh. I do have a gravity, I might have a different gravity constant for the vehicles if we want to have them, you know, fly through the air more or whatever. So that's why I'm doing a const for the gravity here. So we'll do, um, we're also going to need a gravity basis for the vehicle itself. This is something you don't normally need to worry about, but in Kook, you can go through teleporters that reorient your gravity, and there's a bunch of other things that can make you go walk on walls and stuff. So, on the characters and stuff, I have this concept of a gravity basis, which is sort of the matrix that defines the orientation, and then everything operates relative to that. Yeah, there's a lot of good O streamers. So we're doing gravity basis dot y. Oh, actually, this is going to need to be minus because we need to go down. Y is up in ghetto. Um, so we're going to multiply that by gravity. Times delta. All right. Uh, 
So I'm gonna accelerate the gravity there. Uh, oh, it needs to be vehicle to gravity basis. All right, so we're not gonna do that move and slide anymore. Instead, what we're gonna do Back to the velocity. All right, so now we're gonna do is, um, oh, maybe we should have a character body. Hmm, I'm trying to think. It's doing shape casts. Could be problematic if the character, or if the, uh, the vehicle gets stuck. The character bodies will try to resolve the collision if they get stuck for whatever reason, especially if you've got things like a maybe a door or something that moves and the door hits the vehicle. Um, even if you do all perfect calculations to avoid getting stuck in anything, a thing could come along and get stuck in your vehicle. <laughs> so I'm trying to decide if I want to go ahead and use character bodies for that. Hmm. Uh, but the stream's been going for three hours. I'm going to take another stretch break because I seem to seem to go through a bottle of water every hour. So I'm going to go refill and um, be back in a few minutes. After these stretches, we'll be right, right back. back. Here's, oops, wrong channel. <laughs> I typed that in my own channel. Um, here's some projects. Here, here's a link to my projects if you want to check those out. Maybe I should, wait, no, project. There we go. <laughs> Wish list would be much appreciated. Oh, there, there's also a demo for um, Fist of the Forgotten if you want to check that out. Feedback's appreciated too.
All right. Yo, Slax, how's it going? All right, let's see. <laughs> Oop, I just realized I said Gravix T instead of Gravity. I don't know how I did that. Uh, all right, so we're going to accelerate the wheel downward. And then we're going to... Let's accelerate the uh, wheel back velocity there as well. We need to check for the ground and such, but we'll do that later. Uh, okay. So now, what we need to do is do a shape cast, which I've got a shortcut for cast ray and cast sphere. Um, actually, let's do this. Offset is going to be. Vehicle that wheel back velocity times delta. All right, so then we're going to do a cast sphere, which I need to start and end. Uh, Start is going to be that wheel position, and then we'll go from the start to the start plus end. Oh, we need the radius. What you got there? Um, it might kind of depend on when you're looking to, because there's some hours. I hop on and there's like 10 people streaming stuff and get out. It is now 6 a.m. <laughs> it's getting late, guys. 
It's 6 a.m. my time. I've got a notification that pops up that says I'm about to go to bed. Normally I'm not streaming at this hour, so people don't usually hear that. <laughs> Unless I'm doing like a game jam or something. Alright, I'm gonna add a check. Yeah, I'm nocturnal. I, I stay up until the sun rises and beyond. Stay awake forever and ever! How's it going, Evan? How long am I planning on going? Uh, I don't know. Maybe another couple hours. Yeah, it's about the only time it happens is like during game jams or maybe I'm trying to think there might have been a time where I streamed like really really late I don't know that I've ever streamed that late just like on my normal stream though I think it's usually just like game jams where I'm going crazy hours Sorry about the lag. I don't. I don't know what's going on with my computer. It's normally not like, not like that. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to decide what all I want the vehicle to collide with. That should probably be good enough. We'll use that. And then we will ignore the vehicle. No, I did start plus end, not start plus offset. Normally end is start plus offset. Okay. Oh, wait, this needs to be a physics system. Oh, wait, no, I just did physics. Again, talking about how I've got everything set up in systems. So all the physics-related stuff, I've got, like, a uh, has line of sight, sphere test, and then some stuff for setting masks and enabling collision and... Adding velocity to things, adding impulses, getting physics props ready. I got tired of not having the correct number of contacts reported setting it set in uh, data, so then I I make sure this stuff is set. Hey, Kent. You making stuff in Godot, Evan? What are you working on these days? I haven't stopped by your stream in a while. Oh, right. It is an array. There we go. Because you could ignore multiple bodies. Okay.
Let's return shape cast. Not real wheel, the rear wheel. This wheel isn't real, it's a virtual wheel. Welcome back. Let's see, is colliding. All right, so we're gonna check if this is I'm going to do a cast, a sphere cast, see if it's colliding. And if it is, we're probably going to need to do some additional casts. To like, because it's going to hit the ground almost immediately, probably. So we need to make sure that it moves along the ground. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set the um I'm gonna grab the first normal that we hit. Gonna subtract that. So basically what we wanna do is, oh, sorry, this one's not, not flashbang adjusted. Oops. So, if the wheel hits something, in this case, probably going to hit the ground immediately because we're accelerating it down due to gravity. So it's going to hit this, and we've got a downward velocity, or maybe maybe we've got a velocity like this. Let's say it's like at an angle. So we're going to grab the normal, in this case, which is straight up. That's the surface there, and we're going to do the dot product with our velocity and that's going to get us the amount of the velocity that's on the axis of the normal and then we're going to subtract that times the normal which will then give us a new vector that is basically parallel there is a actually there's a projection which is kind of a shortcut for that. I don't remember if I want to use projector reflect. So I'll just do the math myself. <laughs> uh, I 
actually. You know what? Because we're probably going to have to copy paste this code anyway. So. I'm just going to do the calculations with that. And then we'll assign it back later, hopefully, <laughs> if I remember. All right, so we're going to grab the velocity off the back wheel, figure out the offset, do a shape cast, check if it's colliding. It's colliding. We're going to subtract that. And that's going to need to be. We need this multiple times, so. that so normal times normal dot velocity Actually, I'm not sure if I need to subtract or add This is where we look at some of the movement system code that past Jitspo did. Wait, did I use the projector? Handle collisions thing that I did. I did velocity. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, let's just do this. I've got that in the movement system anyway. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, movement dot handle collision. Velocity, normal, and up. Which we're not using. Okay. Why do I even have that then? I could probably just delete it. I'm worried that I'm, as soon as I delete it, I'm going to need it later. Eh, whatever, Hilo. <laughs> fix all the things that are complaining about it now. I don't know if that's something that I needed at some point and then didn't need, or that I thought I needed. Well, it's a little refactoring amongst friends, huh? Goodness gracious, I call this function a lot. Anybody else? Okay. What is dot? Dot does the dot product. So dot product is um, <laughs> dot product is a really useful tool in game development. So in the case in the case that I'm doing here, I'm doing the dot product of the normal and the velocity, and what it's going to do is it's going to give me the amount that one vector is on another. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can try to explain this a little better. So, simple case. If you've got a vector that is a length of one and it's going in uh, a direction and then you've got another vector that's a length of one and it's going exactly that same direction, the dot product is going to be one. So you can use dot product to check if you're facing a similar direction. Um, if you've got a vector that is pointing 90 degrees off to the side, the dot product is going to be zero. And if you've got a vector of length of one that is pointing the complete opposite direction, then the dot product is going to be negative one. 
and that value also happens to correspond to the cosine of the angle <gasps> between these vectors. So it can be used to really optimize some trig stuff. It's also really useful for lighting because you check the dot product of the light compared to the surface. And so you can see like the light is directly going into the surface, then it's full brightness. But if it's like negative below zero, then the light is basically hitting it from the other side. So it has no lighting. And uh, hey, Tibo. Hello, hello. Um, but yeah, the other thing the dot product can be used for is to basically cancel out velocity when you hit a surface. So in this case, I'm taking the normal, which is a unit vector that um, indicates basically the direction away from a surface. And we're basically taking that and doing the dot product with the velocity. So if the velocity is going into this, we can do the dot product together and we figure out how much of this vector going into the surface is actually going into the surface. And then we can subtract that out and then we get the vector that's going parallel to the surface. So that's what that handle collision is doing there. Basically taking this and then subtracting that out. So, um, I want to take the velocity, oops, and the normal. Oh, and Godot has not updated the fact that I removed that third parameter. <laughs> Sometimes when you update files, it gets confused. We could just do like a project reload here. That should fix it. Been on all day yesterday and today now? Not all day. I streamed for like four or five hours. Yeah, it is kind of funny when you catch somebody and it's like, you catch them in the window of time they're doing something, and then you come back to like hours later, and then they're just like still there, but really they've taken a break and done some stuff and then come back. It's like, oh my gosh, this guy never stops streaming. I've had that happen before. Like, I'll raid somebody at the end of my stream, and then go off and eat and then do some other things, go to bed, come back, <laughs> open Twitch to do my stream and it's like, wait a second, that stream's still going. Oh wait, he didn't actually stream for the past like 20 hours. <laughs> Although sometimes if you're rating somebody doing a game jam or something, they may have actually been streaming for 20 plus hours. That definitely happens. All right, um, oh, I actually need to take the result of this handle collision because that returns another vector three. So the velocity is going to be equal to that 
to the cast sphere give us I don't know that that actually gives us the distance that we moved. Shh, 12 feet. I thought that was, that was a secret. Not game jam material yet. They can be pretty intense. But also, you know, you can take it casually and just be like, yeah, I'll make something little, whatever. The advantage to game jams is it actually pressures you to identify the most critical aspects of a video game to actually make it playable and get it out. Which is a very important skill to have because a lot of times we get caught up on all these little things that, yeah, it's nice to fix them, but like, there could be some glaring fundamental aspect of your game that is completely unimplemented that you should really be working on instead of, uh, you know, I don't know, trying to align some text somewhere, <laughs> whatever it is you're working on. Yeah, that's true. You can also team up with other people and be like, yeah, I'll work on some aspect of this, but I'm not ready yet to do a whole game by myself. That's one thing I haven't tried yet. I haven't tried doing a team game jam. I don't know. I like game jams, but it's it feels difficult to justify spending the time working on a game jam as opposed to your main project. But like I said, there's definitely should definitely do a couple game jams just to go through the process of making a game from start to finish in a short period of time and identifying the important aspects of actually getting a game done and playable. Uh, all right, so we got our velocity after the collision. Um, we need to figure out how much more we need to move. The way I typically do this is a little while function. So while we need movement, immediately before I forget, we'll set needs movement to false, so we don't do any additional steps. I have worked at Pro Studios, yeah. Um, I don't know. Oh, I mistyped that. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? It's literally the line above that. That's declared. I don't know that... I don't know. Big studios are completely different beasts. It's like 90% of the time is spent on communication and other stuff. Hey, Maker. Yeah, I am not really sure about how you identify a team to work with. I think, you know, if you start participating in some game jams and start, like, hanging out with the community, especially, like, Ludum DeRay, there's there's kind of, like, a Ludum DeRay group that I am, uh, you know, kind of familiar with and hang out with. People that participate pretty regularly and... We all kind of know each other and hang out in each other's streams. So I think at that point, like once you've built up some familiarity with people, then it's probably easier to jump in and be like, yo, you know, 
be cool if we did something together. Oh, we're talking about game jams. Miltage, hello, hello. Oh, uh, let's see. Needs movement. Um, You doing the pirate software jam? Nice. A school game jam? Cool. What's the difference between Jitspo and Godot Engine Official? So Jitspo is my personal Twitch account, and Godot Engine Official is, well, the official Godot Engine Twitch account. And so they're doing this takeover week thing where they have invited members of the Godot community to do live streams on the official channel. So this whole week there's going to be different people streaming every day. Need to write a complete uh, I'm I mean, there's there's value to game design, Zox, but a lot of games, I feel like you got to kind of figure out. It's very difficult to plan out the whole game unless you're like taking a, a known concept of a video game and you're like, all right, we're going to take, I don't know, something like Counter-Strike and then we're going to add abilities to it. Like you might be able to write up a game design doc, but if you're like trying to make something new and fun, it's very difficult to plan out the whole dock and then just implement it because things that sound like a great idea on paper, as soon as you go to implement them, maybe aren't as fun as some other little thing you've prototyped. Like as soon as it hits the trial by fire and you're actually sitting there playing it or giving it to other people to play, you might realize there's some fundamental issues in your design that like are not salvageable fundamentally and you have to go in a different direction so trying to write a complete design doc I'm I, I, like you want to have direction for the project so I feel like it's better to have like high level stuff and then start developing some things and experiment and then redirect as necessary although if you've got a very large team that's a little more difficult to do that's I think where the, the design docs are a little more valuable especially if you've got like an established IP or something like if you're making another Call of Duty game you probably want to probably got things, ideas and stuff that you've planned out from the previous ones that either you didn't have time to implement or um you know, that's the type of thing you want to do for the next project. Not the same time. I actually stream um, at, I start around 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, which, uh, what is that? like 11 30 p.m utc so that's usually when i start streaming and go on for i don't know five hours or so yeah prototyping and playtesting are important and getting fresh people to play test your game that have never played it before and don't have any idea how it plays because you will Man, nothing, nothing makes you realize 
like how much more feedback and stuff you need like going to a convention and having your game out and watching like a whole bunch of people play like the first five or ten minutes of the game over and over again you have like pages and pages of notes of like all the things you need to fix all the things players get stuck on all the things they didn't see and it's like all right and then you do that and then you're like man i got it it's all good we got all this stuff and then you do it again and then like you're just like oh my gosh there's so many more things had you steampunk motorcycle physics Ugh. yeah we're we're trying that i've got <laughs> i should probably launch the game i haven't done this in a while uh what was launch right now I'm like halfway through writing some code. Exactly, makerisms. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Not the level I made meant to load, but hey. Let's show this off real quick. I've got a I've got a Godot plush. Special kook edition. With the <laughs> with the kook goggles. Yeah, so there's physics objects in this game that you can pick up and throw. Doors you can kick. Uh, if anybody has arachnophobia, I would advise looking away right now. Because I've got some creepy nightmares. Okay, they're gone now. <laughs> you can use physics objects to kill things. Good times. And your feet. Yeah, I haven't shown the game in a little bit. I'll just show this one weapon real quick and then we'll go over to the steam cycle. It's, it's more fun if you get them all to trigger, trigger into the bubble at the same time. Also, you can jump on the spikes. Your game's in not Well, there's that web game. That web game has you playing as a spider. Oops. Uh... I showed the bike early on, so this is the steam steam cycle that I'm working on. This is the old version. I was doing an experiment where I made it entirely rigid body physics based, just to see if it would work. So like I don't really have any concept of, you know, propelling the bike with velocity. I actually just spin the back wheel, and the spinning of the back wheel and the friction on the ground actually ends up pushing it forward using joints and stuff which is a fun experiment but it's very difficult to control like it tends to it's kind of fun to tinker around with but it's got a really wide turning radius and just trying to get it to do anything you want is a bit of a challenge so you can kind of take it off some ramps and stuff but half the time it just like freaks out and goes bonkers. So I'm rewriting it from scratch tonight. I don't know how far we're going to get. You can also jump off of it and let it go. Oh, there we go. There's some crazy physics. <laughs> and it's gone. So, yeah. <laughs> the joys of trying to use uh, rigid bodies and being at the mercy of video game physics. Oh, now it's kind of stuck. There we go. So it's like, it's kind of impressive that it actually works. And it even has some of the self-writing physics just inherently in there. Because of the way it's, the hinge joint is set up on an angle on the front. Um, 
But yeah, not super ideal for players actually wanting to go in a specific direction. <laughs> Title screen with some pizzazz. <laughs> but yeah, the new one I'm doing with a character body and some shape cast for the wheels. And we'll see if that is maybe maybe a little better. Oh, thanks, Captain. Yeah, game jams are a good way to just, like, work on a thing that maybe you're not super good at. Just force yourself to improve. Make the Tron light cycle. Yeah, that you definitely wouldn't want to do with physics. Because it's basically just go at a set velocity, turn 90 degrees. Well, I'm using the Jolt Physics add-on for Godot, so it's not quite as unpredictable. <laughs> I'm gonna make some motorcycle game eventually. Oh, nice. I've never driven a motorcycle, so I don't know. I'd be, I'd be too paranoid. Not just, uh, you know, myself, but like other people on the road. It's nice to have a little bit of a, you know, cushion around you, so you don't immediately get squashed. You've seen more of my game in the last hour than the... <laughs> really? Do I do that bad of a job showing my game off? I need to get better about that then, huh? Learned a lot about the animation player? Nice. By the way, speaking of promoting my stuff... If you want to check out the Steam page for Kook and Fist of the Forgotten, there are links to those. Okay, so let's see. We need to actually move the rear wheel and then... Try to, I don't know. Let's just write some code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the things you can do with the animation player in Godot are really crazy. It's like so many different properties can be animated. Let me think. Um, okay, so we handled the collision at the velocity. We need to say move steps plus equals one. If move steps is less than max steps. So basically we're going to limit how many possible movement steps we have here. Is 
so we don't run into a situation where we've collided with a whole bunch of stuff and then we do you know a hundred movement steps in one frame and that's like super slow that's an add-on called ridiculous coding so if you just go to the asset library and search for ridiculous you can thank Johnson for that. Also, instead of delta here, what we need is the step delta. Because we need to subtract. So if we moved like half of our movement to hit the ground, then we're going to need the other half of the movement to handle, you know, what we did beyond that. So we're going to start off with delta. Um that so just doing colon equals is like an automatic thing so I could do that to specify that this is an integer but if I use zero it's going to just automatically infer it based on the type so this is going to be a boolean because I have set it to true. Um, that is going to be an integer because it was set to an integer. If I did 0.0, .0 it would become a float. And then move delta is going to be a float because delta was passed in here and that is a float. No, it's sometimes if you're assigning like an unknown variable, like a variable you don't know the type of, then you have to explicitly specify it. But most of the time you can just get away with colon equals. A hot bar, huh? We're going to serve like hot chocolate and tea and coffee there. <gasps> oh, nice. You got the star. <laughs> By the way, if anyone wants to show up on the little stream avatars thing, you can go over to my Twitch channel. I was not able to set it up so that it would work with the uh, official Twitch channel because I don't have the... Um, actual login there, which stream avatars needs. <laughs> yeah, sick jump! 12 feet up! Wow. All right. Uh, oh, right. We need to figure out the move delta. Uh, let's see. So move delta times equals. We need to figure out what the fraction is. I don't know the shape cast. I'm trying to remember what shape cast has. Do we have a distance?
Well, let's see. Return to collision point. The shape intersects. Is that the actual point? Oh, fraction. Here we go. Uh, get closest collision. Safe fraction. That's what we want. So basically, if we hit something, so if we've got our sphere and we move down and we hit something and we've moved like 50% or maybe like, I don't know, we're just like barely above the ground so we move like 10% of our movement. So the safe fraction is going to be 0.1 and then we got to do the rather 90, excuse me, 90% 90 of our movement horizontally along the ground. So that's going to be 1.0 minus that. Um, yeah. Found a way to implement it more simply? Nice. Yeah, the typing is a Godot add-on called Ridiculous Coding. Fun times. Oh, I'm actually really close to leveling up here. We might level up tonight. Might make it to level 87. We'll get some fireworks and such. <laughs> Gamify all the things. Life's too short to not be playing games all the time, right? reminds me there was a thing that I was playing for a little bit that was like an RPG game for doing tasks so you like put your daily tasks in there and then you like as you would do them you know it was an honor system right because you had to go in and say like oh I did these things and then you like level up your character and then you could fight bosses and such Wonder what happened to that game. If it's still around. Oh, uh, let's see. So hopefully this is enough. And that doesn't get stuck. <laughs> um Oh yeah, I guess we need to update... So start is going to be that here. And then if we need more movement, the start is going to be... Um, let 
Maybe I should have a character body for the wheels. I'm not sure if the shape casts are going to cut it. Well, let's just write some stuff. <laughs> Guess I might have to swing by my stream tomorrow to see this carried on in development. Uh, oh, you know what? I haven't checked Discord. How do you install Ridiculous Coding? Uh, just go to the Asset Library and then search for Ridiculous and then you click on it and click on Download and then you go to Project Settings and uh, Ridiculous Coding. Make sure that's enabled. And you might have to restart the editor. I can't remember for sure. But then you should be good to have all kinds of crazy effects and such. Yeah, I'm not sure what the Cupix version is. The version that Jotson made is the one that I'm using. I think Cupix made have just, I don't know, extended it and made some other stuff. Or I don't know if anybody knows what the difference between the two is. Let me know. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, Justin's a cool dude. All right, so let's see. We need to set the start position to the shape cast. Actually. I did this. Well, I don't know if I've still got this in here. I did a shapecast version of my movement for the player to see how things are going. Why did I divide it by displacement length? I am still awake, yeah. I'm normally awake at this hour. 
How do you enable it? Uh, go to the project settings and then click over on the plugins tab and there should be a checkbox to enable it. Yeah, I'm super nocturnal. So it's like 7 a.m. here. <laughs> I'm still up, still loving at it. Oh, I see. I multiplied the fraction. Yeah, this is a weird behavior of Godot. If both of these fractions are one, then it's like it's starting solid. Hmm. Satisfying? Nice. Actually, probably since I'm going to do two different wheels. What I should do is have like a move wheel function. We'll pass in the... Oh, let's see. We've got multiple things we're returning though. Yeah, we'll just worry about the back wheel for now. That might be all we get tonight. This is kind of like trying to do a week plus of work in one night. So, I mean, trying to make a vehicle move around is not a small task. Yeah, actually, I think I'm going to take a quick break, and then I will be back in a few. Oh, wait, i got to type that on my channel. <laughs> to get my AFK sound. After there we these go. Stretches, we'll be right back. I'm used to all the stuff I've got set up for my stream. It's a little bit different. Working on a different stream. Sometimes forget that I'm streaming on a different channel.
getting to that age now where if I don't get up every hour or so and move around, I feel it. <laughs> Not in a good way. You started that at age 23? Of course, when I was younger, I could never sit still to begin with, so... Maybe you just don't sit still as much. <laughs> mm. Oh, right. I don't remember what I was doing now. I was going to write a... <gasps> I was going to write a helper function because I don't want to duplicate all this code. But... I don't know, this is going to be kind of hacky, but I'm just going to do move uh, do vehicle Actually, let's do this Hey, I leveled up! So you got the effects <laughs> It happens Actually, we'll just do this. We'll just do move wheel, pass in the vehicle, and it's kind of. I'm not happy with this, but it's just sort of a quick thing, just to kind of get things implemented. And then the next second parameter is going to be if it's a front wheel or a back wheel. It is back wheel. Boolean. So... Apologies for the bad code here. What's the reverse of a pin for a raise? Pop, maybe? E or... Is that what you want to do, like remove? The last element? Yeah, pop. So... Not that pop. Oh, there's a pop back and a pop front. So whether you want to... Pop back is probably the one you want. Erase removes a specific one. If you want to remove a specific value, 
And there's also delete if you want to. Is it delete? No. Remove at. Remove at removes something at a specific index. Erase moves removes a specific element that matches the value you pass in. So now what we're going to do is say if is back wheel do that It's actually a good thing I did this because I realized I was setting the velocity to the wheel velocity right at the, at, the, at each iteration, so it wouldn't have taken their updated one. Uh, all right. So then after our movement. That way we can reuse the code for the front wheel and the back wheel. And then if I need to do like a four wheeled vehicle or something like that, then I can make it a little less yucky than this. But sometimes it's better just to do things in the most minimal way possible. And then worry about making it more complicated when they need to be. All right, so if it's the back wheel, we're gonna do this else. The start's going to be the vehicle wheel front dot global position. The velocity is going to be the vehicle oops the front velocity. Okay, so next step is we need to update the start position. That's where I was going to go into this, where I've already done this stuff <laughs> and dealt with the weird mysteries. <clears throat> Starting solid and whatnot. I think we do need to return a value because we don't actually want to <clears throat> we don't actually want to move the nodes where the wheels are supposed to start but 
Wait, that's the back rows. Our back rows. I'm gonna add a variable called rear, but I think I'm using back. Hmm. The joy of English and variable names and so many different synonyms. Is it the back wheel? The rear wheel? What's the advantage of building your own engine over engines like a doe? The real so there's a couple reasons. One is if you just want to learn some stuff and you're doing like some engine building, just to kind of learn the systems and things. The other is if you're building a specific type of game that requires technology that other engines don't provide. Like I think uh, Teardown is probably a good example of that. Have you guys seen the, the Teardown game that's got all these like voxel based destruction simulations and such and it's like you might be able to implement that it might be worth implementing that as like an, some aspect of an existing engine but you know it would be difficult to get existing engines to do that without a lot of work Finally streaming on a time you can watch. <laughs> Hello, Welland. Yeah, Noid is another example where every pixel was like physically simulated. There are some sound commands that work, but only the ones that were brought over to Wolfman Bot 2. I'm actually surprised people haven't been like trying to use them. <laughs> Random sound never got made its way to Wolfman Bot 2 yet. Yeah, I f there's with as advanced as engines are becoming these days, I feel like there's fewer and fewer reasons to build your own engine. By the way, I appreciate everybody that's been following on my other channel. If you guys want to catch more devs, dev streams, you can... Uh, I guess click on my name here and then go over there and follow me. <laughs> You're tempted. <laughs> yeah, that's one I was given as an example, Woland. It's, uh, it's like something like that. Like you could probably... I mean, honestly, what I think I would do is I would use Godot and let it handle like the UI and sound and a bunch of other things that I wouldn't really feel like implementing and then just tap into the render server and do my own thing if I want to do like a whole new custom render thing if I was doing voxels or whatever. Because, yeah, that's the cool thing about Godot is you can modify it, right? There's there's so much that goes into an engine, so many things you don't really even think about until you have to do them all. There's like a ton of just busy work. That's why it's nice to have open source engines like Godot, where you can just take and like, all right, I'll use Godot as kind of a base and then implement all the stuff that I want my own way without having to write everything from scratch. Yeah, Godot's fairly easy to modify once you get it um, set up. You have to like set up scons and I can't remember if there's anything else you have to set up. Scons is the big one. 
are they still using scones? I can't remember. Uh, but there, there's a step-by-step -step guide. You just got to go to the uh, yeah, like how to build an engine um, guide on the Gitto, like tutorial page, and just do all the steps there. And then for Windows, you can create a Visual Studio project. So I've actually got this open here, um, which I tend to have this open if I ever like look at something and want to figure out like how does this work under the hood then you can just pop it open and have a look-see yep yeah if you fix something in the engine you can uh, do pull requests and um, Contribute back. Oh yeah, that's right. Brackies is doing uh, Godot tutorials. Yeah, good. He's got a nice one getting started. I do have a couple tutorials. Um, I need to do some. I think the ones I've got for or for Godot three, they're they're still kind of applicable. But I've had a few people in the comments kind of confused because they get some errors in the scripts just due to subtle changes. Yeah, I've got a I've got a Godot shader tutorial. Uh hang on. Oops. Oh shoot. I can't remember uh Is it getting started with shaders? Darn it. <laughs> I got it somewhere, hang on. By the way, if you guys wanna get some highlights of my development stuff. Got a bunch of highlight videos and stuff on my YouTube channel. And where's the shader one? Ah, there it is. There's the shader one specifically. Oh wait, not at that time though. It's like half watched. <laughs> it's actually pretty easy to, to jump into the shaders. like. Because you can actually use one of the default materials and then just convert it to a shader material. And then, so you can set up things, like start setting them up the way you want them to be. And then um, you just work off of that. So if you're like, I want a texture that's, or, you know, I want a material that has a texture and um, some metallic and stuff. And then you set those parameters in the shader and then you convert it, or set those parameters in the material, then you convert it to a shader and then it has all the code there for you and you just modify the things you want. <laughs> and Godot 4 actually has and Oop. Godot 4 actually uh, has and Oop. Godot 4 sorry about that. <laughs> apparently okay. Apparently I had that in a background tab and then when it went foreground, it decided to play the sound. Too many jitspos. Yeah. Too many pose. Call the police. I'm behind myself. Well, somebody's got to back me up, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get this functional. <laughs> I said tonight, it's actually this morning. Uh, okay.
I guess is colliding is probably the same as collision counters greater than zero. Do displacement. Keep that consistent. Lerp is such a cool word. It's actually a shortening of two words combined together. Linear interpolation. It's fun when you do the spherical version for like quaternions, then it becomes slurp. Oh, yeah. I think the explosions are reserved for um, deletions. So that does an explosion. Well, it's kind of weird that it showed shift plus home. Oh, I think it shows the last thing you typed. So if you use the mouse So if you do control X, then it'll show that. But if you do that, it shows the last thing you typed. Okay. Well, we need to pass that in, don't we? Ba -ba -ba. Details, details. Things need to exist before they can be used. Crazy concept, huh? It's super satisfying. Yeah, it's. It feels so weird after you've been using it for a while, and then you like work on a project that you don't have it installed, and you're just typing away, and it's just like click, click, click. What's, what's going on? What's wrong with my keyboard? Where's all the sounds? Oh right, I don't have ridiculous coding installed. Oh, bold of you to assume the vehicle even moves. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps I should have gotten a little more basic stuff in place before doing the Godot stream, but that's okay. I do have the old version that uses all rigid body physics, so that one's kind of fun.
It's going to become a new default. Nice. Yeah, we did get sidetracked on a couple other things too, so it wasn't like super unproductive or anything. Yeah, I didn't know how far I'd actually get on this because it is a pretty complicated thing to implement. <laughs> Lost, Woland. Lost. You mean many points were well spent. Valiantly sacrificed. <laughs> oh yeah, I need to return the position. When all is said and done... Not colliding with anything. Position is going to be the end. <laughs> He's just a little guy. <laughs> I think the plushie, like, removed all the criticisms about the Godot logo. Was it just what we're writing now? So I am, um, let's see if this does anything right now. <laughs> I'm working on a game called Kook. And I've got this Steam steam powered motorcycle or steam cycle this is a retro fps but uh thought it'd be fun to have a steam cycle and so the first implementation this one which i've got uh <laughs> a different texture on it just so we can distinguish between the two um but i experimented with doing it entirely rigid body based just to see if it would even work i didn't really expect it to it actually ended up working better than i thought it would uh, so it's using, like, physics joints, or hinges, I guess the hinges are joints, and then a motor to actually rotate the rear wheel, and then the traction and stuff actually, actually propels it around. Surprisingly, it works, but it's very difficult to control, and oftentimes just goes completely bonkers. Uh, at some point, I want to add side-mounted Gatling guns to it. Maybe. At the moment, you, you if you've got uh, weapons, you can shoot. But I'll probably have the hands on the handlebars. Unless maybe I do, like, one-handed weapons only or something. But as you can see, I'm struggling just to get up the hill here. Uh, there we go. 
and then just trying to steer it over here to get up to the ramps. Wee, and then it <laughs> and then it does stuff like this, and it's like, well. So, um, the objective tonight was to rewrite this. I've got the new one here, but it doesn't actually move yet. <laughs> you can get onto it. Oh, you look at it. Uh, but the new one is going to be, um, I'm going to use like shape casts and a uh, character body on it so that it doesn't, so I have like full control over exactly how it behaves rather than being at the mercy of the, uh, rigid body physics engine. I'm thinking about making a game like Dwarf Fortress. That's, uh, sounds like a large undertaking, but it could be fun. Imagine driving the bike in VR, yeah. It's awesome that it works at all, yeah. I'm, like I said, I'm really surprised. Because literally all it is... So here's the physics-based one. Um, if we just collapse the, uh, the mesh there. So all we've got here is... So this is a rigid body, and we've got just the the main body of it here. It's just a box, and that's the mesh. And then we've got a hinge joint for the rear wheel. And I was like, oh wait, you can specify motors on hinge joints and make them rotate at a at a set velocity. I wonder if I can just use that and then give this like a high friction. And then it'll just like move the thing, and it and it kind of does, like it kind of works. And we've got another joint here for the steering, and then connected to that joint is the front wheel. And so the front wheel also has a hinge joint that it lets it rotate around, and so by turning the steering physics body. And then rotating this with the motor, that actually, like, works. <laughs> Just use your feet to steer, yeah. My driving's getting better. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta disable the head bobbing and stuff. Like, literally, it's just... That's the other thing I got here. I've got a player position. And then we just... Every frame, we update the player to be at that position. <laughs> Had a motor just added to the cycle? Yeah. Uh, the brake system is I reverse the velocity of that the motor. <gasps> um, I've only done front wheel drive or rear wheel drive. Sorry. How do people use sound commands? <laughs> you haven't figured it out yet? What am I coding? I'm working on uh, making this steam-powered motorcycle. Do I use a state machine for different movement modes? Sort of. So... Um... I'll show you my movement system here. Unless you're talking about the motorcycle. The motorcycle stuff is not is too early on to show much. So for the um, for the movement system, I've got like a move swim. 
So basically we've got a generic move function that handles a bunch of different things. The problem with a lot of state machines is they're like you're in one explicit state at a time. Whereas with player movement, I find that you're oftentimes in multiple states. Like maybe you're moving, you're swinging with a grapple, but you're also in the water. So, you know, we have to handle all of these different things. So I do have a movement mode. So if it's, so we check if you're within a certain fraction of the water and if you're below a certain fraction or above a certain fraction of water, then we just do the swim movement, we turn. If you're in the fly movement, we do that, we return. Then obviously if we're dead, we do that movement and return. Um, but otherwise we do kind of the air slash ground movement. It's all kind of one thing. So we've got some drag. Um, and then there's a bunch of complicated stuff because you can be on any axis in this game. So I've got a lot of things that are probably a little more complicated than most games. So check this out. So I'm on this axis over here. I can look down and see this dude clearly on a different axis than me. But if I go through this portal here, now I'm on the same axis as this dude. And if I run down over here, I can look up at the ceiling and that's actually the portal that I went through. And then um, there's some other crazy stuff like this level here where it's sort of like an inverse globe. She got me. <laughs> yeah, there's some scary stuff in this game. Uh, but anyway, the thing I was trying to show off here is that the gravity in this level changes as you move around. So, I have to account for all that kind of stuff in my... Uh, player movement code. How do you type in the chat of an offline channel? <laughs> You just do it. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of uh, weird gravity distortion stuff. Anyway, that's why that's why the movement logic is kind of complicated, and I've got one movement system that I share for enemies and players and such of the vehicles. I might share some functions from the movement system, but they're kind of be kind of their own thing. Reminds you of Mist. Interesting. Was Mist palleted? I'm trying to remember. It might have been palleted back in the day. Needs a punch or a kick? It has him. How does the gravity work? So I've got this uh, concept of a gravity basis, which is like a, a matrix orientation. Um, here, I'm just going to show the kick really quickly. See, got a kick, got a punch. Not sure why the punch is not. Okay. I guess the punch does not apply impulses to physics things? Did there. Huh. 
Yeah, maybe the uh, shape cast is getting blocked by the ground there. <laughs> Poor Godot plushie. Can showcase how fun the kick is. Here. Oh, oh, actually, I'll show you the best part about the kick. Since you can kick objects, and you can pick up, and you can drop objects, you can also drop kick objects. Oh, I messed up. There we go. That got him. Pumpkin to death. There's not a gravity gun. There is a time distortion gun. There may be... I don't know if I'm going to have a... I'm, I'm probably going to make some, like, gravity grenades. I think the, gra the grenade launcher is going to have, like, a gravity alt fire. Uh, but... I do have this thing, which is fun. <laughs> so, this this will pin guys up against the wall, or maybe even the ceiling at this angle. <laughs> if I don't hit the railing. There we go. But yeah, the time distortion's fun. What keys are they bound to? Uh, are you talking about the kicking and punching? Well, the punching is just your primary attack when you don't have a weapon equipped. And kick is... I think it's like F or G by default. Camera off the top of my head. But you can go in and customize your key bindings. A plushy mama boss. <laughs> boo boo Rocket jumping? Yeah, we got uh, we got that too. I actually have. Uh, it's not. Oh wait, there it goes. We got a tagging system. Forgot I need to fix this uh, alt fire to not cool down the main fire. But if you if you hit somebody with a tag, then the uh, the rocket will go to them, <laughs> which is fun. I don't know that I have enough health to survive. Oh, let me if I grab this health and armor. I can do a rocket jump and not just obliterate myself. There we go. Yeah. So we got rocket jumping. And grenade jumping. Lots of movement based things. Hang on. Another thing you can do. Actually. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to jump out of here. No. I died. Uh, but. You can do jumps with pretty much all the weapons. So we got this nine barreled rifle can see I can't quite jump over the fence here but boom fire the weapon gives me a little extra boost shotgun a little extra boost but if I fire all three at once boom and the alt fire on the flamethrower it's kind of like a jet engine basically you can also use it to launch enemies back <laughs> so, lots of fun movement based stuff in the weapons.
Oh, and, um, sorry, I'm behind on chat here, but I want to show off one more thing. Wait, which one? This one. Um, you can actually put spikes in the wall. Say I wanted to get up there. Oh, look, I mean, I made myself my own little staircase to get up to some place. <laughs> The TTP. <laughs> Probably pretty shorts. Can the objects be used to break the speed? Um, it's probably going to be lots of breakage happening. <laughs> Not sure what you mean by break the speed, though. <laughs> Oops. That one in a bad spot. Right. Oh, and one weapon I haven't shown off. This. I haven't decided if this is going to be its own standalone weapon or an attachment or something else, but we do have a grapple. We okay, something is weird with it. All right, I'm not. <laughs> this is not exactly the most ideal level for grappling. Although, the fun thing you can do is you can hop around and use the grapple to maintain your momentum going around corners. So you can really build up some speed. I'm sure the Twitch compression loves this. Whee. Oh, there was like an object on that wall there. Okay. Just trying to figure out why I slowed down. <laughs> yeah, this is not the most ideal level for uh, swinging around on grapple. You can do it, but it's better if you've got some, like, overhanging stuff. There we go. That's a little better. Uh, this is actually stream number 300 tonight. So, I've been working on it. Mm. It wasn't my primary project for a while. So, but it's it's been like 300 actual like dev days. How does one make a gravel gun? So, I've got a little bit of a combination of kind of rope physics style movement and um, acceleration. I'm trying to think of exactly how it's implemented. So when you grapple onto a point here, there's going to be some acceleration kind of pulling you toward that point. And then there's also going to be... Um, Basically, you cancel out any velocity that's going away from the point or beyond the length of the rope. So you're going to swing, and then if you go beyond the length of the rope, then um, any velocity that's going that way gets canceled out, and then you're left with whatever swinging velocity you have. So as you go across, so now we're like over here, we'd have like that velocity, but then we cancel that out. And now we just keep the velocity that's going that way. Kind of like how you would handle hitting a collision. And so that effectively lets you kind of swing around. There's different styles of grapples too. Some people like just 
disable gravity and everything and just move straight toward the point. I like the more swinging style grapple. Like this map, I think, it's probably better for doing the grapple stuff. Because there's actually stuff above your head. Well, you got something directly over you. There's that. You can actually kind of like swing around a little better. I forgot firing the grapple actually <laughs> triggers all the enemies. So I'll probably have this be kind of like a later weapon that you get, and then have some levels, you know, kind of like floor is lava style levels where you kind of swing around and do stuff. But I don't have a proper grapple level yet. I haven't decided if I want to get a publisher or not. I feel like if I get, if I start getting wishlist numbers coming in at a solid rate, and I feel like I'm going to be able to um, actually, you know, make it, and it'll be a profitable launch, then I'll probably lean away from getting a publisher. Right now... It's a little too early to tell, but my wishlist numbers have been kind of going up recently, so that's been good. At least rate rate of wishlist numbers. Yeah, and if if the right publisher comes along, then you know that's uh, that would definitely influence my decision. Well, I should probably. Get some food and stuff. I did want to try to get this to the point of actually driving the uh, the vehicle around, but I feel like there's there's a little too much left to do <laughs> before we uh, even really get to the. I mean, I did have it moving at one point, but that was not even using the wheels. So don't think that's gonna happen tonight hmm but if you do want to see it happen here, here's me self-promoting you can head on over to my stream give me a follow um, I'm not normally streaming at this hour I'm usually streaming like five to ten hours earlier than this a disco stream in a reasonable time? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, there's there's VODs and stuff, too. Let's see. Let's see. Um, I guess I should promote some of my stuff. So I've got some links to my stuff in the link tree. I've also got uh, 
there's some direct links to whoops ah I did it again there it goes <laughs> direct links to the projects Fist of the Forgotten and Kook are the two big Godot projects I'm working on right now and um, I've got a YouTube channel as well if you guys want to I don't know, check out some of the old streams. I guess that's linked on the link tree, but I'll link that directly to you. Jackie's alive? Um yeah, there's there's a link to my YouTube channel. I've got some some highlight videos of old streams and such. Let's see. Let's see who's live. Oh, look. <laughs> Captain Coder's doing an educational stream on Godot. That's crazy. We got. There's another. Baba D's boys doing something in Godot. That's Godot. Look how many ghost. Look how many Godot streamers are live right now. That's Godot. That's Godot. Godot. Jackie? Where's Jackie? Oh, I just saw another Godot stream. Wait. What? Alright. Where's the search taking me? Because <laughs> it like sh sh went somewhere. But it's not like going to it. Was it Jackie Codes? That's it, okay. I don't know. I don't know that I've been on Jackie Code's stream before. Okay. Am I blind? Was it right there? All right. Oh, do you have to run the raid commands? All right. Well, it's been a pleasure to be able to do this for you, with you, whatever. Um, I have I didn't quite get the vehicle really doing much, but um, you know we made some attempts. We added a feature to the the console, so we got that done. But yeah, I guess uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. If you want to swing by my stream, I'll be doing some stuff tomorrow, and then uh, we've got people lined up. Toodles. for this channel all week long so be sure to you know follow and set, set notifications and stuff if you have not already <laughs> oh Wilhelm's not on there but there is there is one command that's still on here oh the raid already happened. <laughs> oh well. What? The Godot engine raided me? I, I was. I, I bye saw bye everybody. Stream. I, I was lurking. I, I hope you had fun. Um. <laughs>